Hello, and welcome to Session 23 of the Basic Tax Course. We're going to begin Session 23 with a review of the Session 21, 20 quiz. And the first most frequently missed question on the Session 2021 quiz is question number two. A self-employed individual may elect to use the non-farm optional method for calculating self-employment tax not more than five taxable years in his or her lifetime. That is a true statement, and uh, really we didn't spend much time talking about the optional method, so I'm going to pull you over to the answer key here. And on the answer key for question number two, it says, to use the optional method, you must meet the following tests. You have to have net profits from your business that are less than 4851 net profits were less than 72.189% of gross income before expenses, net earnings from self-employment were at least 400 in at least two of the last three years, and you cannot use the optional method for calculating SE tax more than five times in your lifetime. Essentially, the purpose of the optional method is to allow an individual to create a net profit from self-employment purposes for generating self-employment tax, but also to generate some specific benefits such as the earned income credit and the uh, refundable child tax credit. Uh, things like that can be generated as a result of making an election to pay self-employment tax under the optional method, but there is an, a limit on the number of times in your lifetime you can do that. The next question we're looking at is question number seven. A church minister must pay self-employment tax on which of the following sources of income? Now, our course on self-employment, or the two sessions we had on self-employment, covered a lot of stuff, but it didn't really get into ministers. However, if you're looking at the Schedule SE, the long version of the Schedule SE, there is place on there to enter church minister income. And you never know as a tax practitioner when a minister is just going to plunk themselves across from you, opposite you, and want to get their taxes done. And uh, you need to know that the minister's income is subject to self-employment tax. So how much income of a minister is self-subject to self-employment tax? Well, pretty much all of their income from work for the church is, including rental value of his or her home that has been provided rent-free by the church, housing allowance provided by the church, and wedding and funeral fees that they receive for their work as a minister. Now here in the answer key, I did want to read to you what we've put in here. If you are a minister of a church, your earnings, including housing allowance for the services you perform in your capacity as a minister, are subject to self-employment tax. These earnings are subject to self-employment tax whether you are an employee of your church or a self-employed person under common law rules. Qualified services in general are the services you perform in the exercise of your ministry or in the exercise of your duties as required by your religious order. Income you receive for performing qualified services is subject to SE tax unless you have an exemption. Well, the exemption is a specific written exemption form that must be sub submitted to the IRS. And on it, a minister who applies for that exemption is essentially saying that on religious grounds, the religious beliefs prevent them from participating in the Social Security system or the Medicare system, and they refuse to contribute to it. And at retirement, they won't be entitled to receive anything from it either. So most, many ministers will come in and say, yeah, I've heard that we can be exempt from that SE tax. Well, that's true if they, on religious grounds, are willing to forfeit all entitlement to receipt of any Social Security benefits. Most ministers, once they find out that not paying into the system means they're not entitled to receive from the system, change their minds and decide, I think I'll pay into the system. The next question we're looking at is question number eight. Jake is self-employed and single. He pays all of the support of his eight-year-old daughter, Jackie. Jake had no employees during the year and has the following income and expenses to report for the year. Gross receipts from self-employment, $30,000, and he has the following expenses, advertising, supplies, depreciation, medical insurance, and child care. And the question reads, what is Jake's net income from self-employment? Well, what you need to do is, of course, establish what is an allowable expense and what is not. And in the answer key here, I have certainly told you what is allowable. Advertising, supplies, and depreciation are allowable, but the medical insurance premiums that is not an allowable expense when paid for the owner of a business on Schedule C. 
So in the wording of the problem, we tell you that Jake has no employees, and therefore we know that the medical insurance premiums he must have paid would be, well, for himself and his family. And without any employees, he couldn't possibly be claiming an employee benefit deduction on his Schedule C, and he certainly cannot claim a deduction on Schedule C for the cost of medical insurance premiums he pays for himself and his family. So that means that if that deduction is allowed, it would be allowed as an above-the-line deduction on his Form 1040, uh, basically as an adjustment to income. But under no circumstances, circumstances should the medical insurance premiums that he pays for himself or his family go on Schedule C. And then child care. Child care also is not an expense that is deductible on Schedule C. In certain situations, child care may be a deduction for a business if the business is paying the child care for its employees. But if you are self-employed and you're paying child care for your own children, definitely not allowed on Schedule C. If you're allowed a benefit at all, it is as a child independent care credit, and you would need to meet the test for claiming those expenses on Form 2441. So what is Jake's net in income from self-employment? Well, you take the $30,000 of gross receipts, you uh, subtract out the advertising, supplies, and depreciation, and you get $22,500, which makes D the correct answer. The next question we're looking at is question number nine, which of the following is not a deductible expense on Schedule C? Commissions paid to an independent contractor? Yes, those are allowable. You'll need to issue a 1099 miscellaneous where required. Or a draw taken by a proprietor against the self-employment earnings of the proprietor. Well, that's not an allowable expense on Schedule C. And although, well, hopefully you thought that was a simple one to pick out, but lots of business owners seem to think that they should be able to claim a deduction on the Schedule C for the money that they pay them to, to themselves. And oftentimes, preparers will let them do that. But you can't. You are only allowed to claim an expense on Schedule C for wages paid to employees and to independent contractors, but never to yourself. But you are allowed on Schedule C to claim a deduction for wages that you pay to your spouse, and you are also allowed to claim a deduction on Schedule C for FICA taxes that you pay on employee wages, but of course not your own wages. Number 10, Jennifer purchased $15,000 worth of assets for her business on June 30, 2011. Assuming none of the assets was a car, that there is no income limit, and all of the assets have a maker's recovery period of five years, what is the maximum depreciation deduction Jennifer can claim on her Schedule C, including the election to claim a Section 179 expense deduction? Well, we've just set you up with all of the information necessary to determine she is eligible for a Section 179 deduction. And if all of the assets are five-year assets and none of them is a car, then she's going to be allowed to claim a Section 179 deduction for 100% of the cost of the assets, $15,000, and that is going to be making D the correct answer. Question number 12. Farmer Brown can trade his breeding cow for Farmer Jones plow horse when no reportable income will result to farmers Brown or Jones in the course of this trade. That's a big fat false. In order for that kind of transaction to be a tax-free transaction, you have to have a qualifying like-kind exchange. A cow and a horse are not like-kind, and therefore the trade of one business use asset for another business use asset, which are not like-kind, triggers a disposition of those assets, which is reportable on Form 4797. Question number 16, your deduction for which of the following expenses is limited to a specified dollar amount? And the correct answer is C, for gifts. Meals are limited to 50% of your income, but not a specified dollar amount, as is our entertainment expenses. Gifts are limited to $25 a year, and lodging is limited to the actual amount paid for qualified lodging expenses. And on to the mini problem next. Briar Rabbit has started up a produce store called The Briar Patch. He opened his doors for business beginning on July 1st and had the following income and expenses for the year. He had gross receipts of $120,000, interest on a company checking account of $150, advertising expense of, of $3,000, amortization and depreciation allowable for his business for the year is $5,000. He had freight in charges of $5,000, freight out charges of $2,500, inventory purchases of $30,000, Office supplies, $1,000, payroll taxes, $2,500, and salaries and wages, $25,000. Mr. Rabbit took home $1,000 of produce for his family to eat during the year, and on December 31, his closing inventory was $6,000. And your job is to prepare his Schedule C. 
So what are the things I can point out immediately? Well, the first item to point out is, of course, $120,000 will be put as gross receipts for the business. You will not include in gross receipts of the business or as other income on Schedule C the $150. Instead, the $150 of interest income is reportable directly on Briar Rabbit's Form 1040, Line 8. Also on the expense section, I just wanted to point out that the freight in charges belong under cost of goods sold and the inventory purchases belong under cost of goods sold. And also returning to this concept of cost of goods sold, uh, since Breyer started up his business during the year, his opening inventory would be zero. He has made $30,000 of inventory purchases, but since he took home $1,000 of produce for his family to eat, he's going to reduce his cost of inventory purchases by $1,000, which means he will enter $29,000 as cost of purchases under cost of goods sold. He has a closing inventory of $6,000, and that too needs to be reflected on his Schedule C. So on the right-hand side of the page here, I have Briar Rabbit's finished for Schedule C, and you can see we've allocated him a business code. We've provided a description of the principal business activity as produce store, and the name of the business is the Briar Patch. And looking at the other boxes on his Schedule C, we have Item G, did you materially participate in the operation of this business? We check yes. You started or acquired this business during the year? We check the yes box for that. Then item I, it asks, did you make any payments in 2011 that would require you to file forms 1099? Well, we don't have any real big numbers on his Schedule C. The likelihood of that answer is no. And then uh, moving on down the form to the income section. On line 1B, we will enter $120,000 of income, and we then enter on line 4 the cost of goods sold. So let's take a look at cost of goods sold first. Under cost of goods sold, we will label line 33 and check box A, saying that we are using the cost method of evaluating inventory. Then on line 34, was there any change in the method used? The answer is no. And then on line 36, we enter the cost of purchases less items withdrawn for personal use. And that's where we start with the inventory purchase amount of $30,000 and subtract out $1,000 of produce that was used by his family. So on line 36, we will enter the difference between those two numbers, which is $29,000. We also showed you on the expense listing here that there were freight in charges of 5000 Those are listed as an other expense on line 39 or other cost on line 39. We add up 29000 plus 5000 and on line 40 we enter 34000 We subtract out the closing inventory of $6,000 for the end of the year, and that leaves us with the amount entered on line 42, which is 28000 and 28000 is then entered on line 4. And, and that makes lines 5 and 7 $92,000. Now for the other expenses on, over here on the problem itself, take in each of the items that we've given you and transfer that over to the uh, Schedule C to identify the line numbers where we've carried them. So essentially Schedule C for advertising, that goes on line 8, and that's what we've done. And amortization and depreciation allowable, those are entered on line 13. For line 18, we have entered office supplies at $1,000. Line 23, payroll tax is $2,500. And then on line 20. Seven, we enter other expenses as described on line 48. So we go over to page 2 of the, t of the Schedule C, and on part 5, line 48, we've entered freight out charges of $2,500. Finishing off Briar Rabbit Schedule C, we have $39,000 of total expenses. We subtract expenses on line 28 from the income on line 7, and that leaves Briar Rabbit with a net profit from his business of $53,000. So that concludes the review of the Sessions 20 and 21 quiz answer key. Let's now take a look at the Session 22 homework assignment. And for our next topic of the day, we're going to take a look at the homework assignment from Session 22. And in Session 22, of course, we looked at a number of different topics, including amended returns. And the homework assignment we left you with was to prepare an amended return for Dr. Hewer. 
Uh, and it, it's a fairly complex amendment in that there's quite a bit going on with changes in itemized deductions, chain of creation of a Schedule C. He's got an additional tax because of self-employment tax. He's got additional adjustment items because of the, the adjustment for the deductible part of the self-employment tax. So quite a bit going on on this tax return. And of course, the problem is that Dr. Hewer forgot to include consulting income for work he performed uh, from home on his original return, and he received a 1099 miscellaneous in the mail, and so, well, that clued him in he needs to amend. And he has no expenses, so we kept that part simple. Dr. Hewer has realized that he did not claim his niece, Sally Hewer, as a dependent. She lived with him all year. Because she is his niece and she lived with him all year, and looking at her date of birth being 1995, she is under age 17, she's going to be a qualifying child for purposes of the child tax credit, and she will obviously qualify him for head of household. So, so we should be looking for a change in filing status there. A copy of Dr. Hewer's original return is attached. Go ahead and prepare his amended return. And here is the answer key for his amended return. The first step in preparing an amended return is, of course, to prepare another corrected Form 1040. That's the first thing we're going to do. And so let's just go in the answer key until we get to that corrected 1040. And here it is. And you will see that we've got Dr. Hewer. Uh, we have changed his filing status to head of household. We have added Sally Hewer as his niece and checked the child tax credit box. His wage line, line 7, has not changed. His income is still $55,000, and we can see over here his original return, 55000 is the same. Line 8 at 300 is the same. Line 9A at 300 is the same. But on line 12, we have now added $2,000 of self-employment income. So line 22 was $55,600. It is now gone to $57,600. Next, we have changes in the adjustments to income. We have a deductible part of the self-employment tax, and we've listed that at $141. Clearly, we have to attach a Schedule SE to show how we computed that. And on line 30, we're showing the original amount of the early withdrawal penalty. $75 is showing on both the original and corrected returns. And moving on to page 2 of the form, adjusted gross income on line 38 of the corrected return is 57.384 versus 55.525 on the original return. Line 40, we're coming to a difference as well. And although on the surface it would seem that the itemized deduction should not have changed, Dr. Hewer is claiming the optional state sales tax deduction on his Schedule A. And because he went from having one person in his household to having two, or went from one exemption to two exemptions, the amount of deduction he's allowed for the state sales tax has increased. And so his deductions have gone up. Let's just go take a look at the original versus the corrected Schedule A. On the original return, we showed that Dr. Hewer's general state sales tax deduction was $4,065. On the amended return, it has gone to $4,152. So here is the state and sales tax deduction worksheet for Dr. Hewer's corrected return. Here is the deduction worksheet for his original return. And we can see that the amount of deduction he is allowed goes up when he has two exemptions rather than one. On the original return, it was 686. On the corrected return, you should have been able to pull the $775 off of the table. And the state and local rates stay the same at local rate of 1.7 and a state rate of 6.5. But the, because line 1 is higher, line 6 increases from 179 to 197. And the overall deduction is now 4152 instead of 4065. So we show 4152 on Dr. Hewer's corrected return, where we had 4065 on his original return. All of the other deduction amounts remain the same. We get down to line 29 with a bottom line of 13,790, and on the original return that was 13,703. Let's take a look at his Schedule C. And on the Schedule C, Dr. Hewer has only one income item, $2,000. He has no expenses, so that's simply carried to line 12 of his 1040. But we also had the self-employment tax, and so we prepared a Schedule SE. You figure, using Schedule SE, that his, his self-employment tax is $246. His adjustment to income for the deductible part of the tax is $141. And let's now move on to his corrected 1040X. We begin at the top of the 1040X by checking 2011. That is the year for which this amendment relates. And we are indicating 
that the filing status has changed to head of household. Moving on to the line entries, we show amounts in column A as they appeared on Dr. Hewer's original return. And on column C, we report the amounts as shown on his corrected return. And then in column B, we show the net change. Significant changes are, of course, that the itemized deduction amount has changed, as has the income amount. And also, we have changed the exemption deduction. So all in all, the taxable income on the original return was 38122 but on the corrected return, it is 36194 and that gives us a change in taxable income of $1,928. Moving down to the tax, we go to the tax tables for head of household vis-a-vis -vis single on the original return, and overall tax has dropped by $837. We're also adding in a child tax credit, so overall tax has dropped by $1,837 after credits. However, we need to add in the self-employment tax, and that bumps his tax up again. But he still has a net reduction in overall tax. His tax has gone down by $1,591. Now we are assuming that he paid in or had a refund, and on the original return, we show that he actually owed 656, so we indicate that that amount, we assume that amount was paid, and of course you would normally ask a client if they've paid what they owed with their original return. In Dr. Hewer's case, he has, so we show 656 as paid in, and that makes the refund the same as the difference in the overall tax. Moving on to page two of the 1040X, we do show the original exemptions claimed, the corrected exemptions claimed, and the name of the dependent who is claimed on the corrected return that did not appear on the original return. And then of course in the, in the description section, we provide an explanation of the changes made. So that concludes the review of Dr. Hewer's tax return. It is now time to take the session 22 quiz. So at this point, please push pause on video playback and complete the session 22 quiz. When you are ready, please resume playback for the session 23 lecture. And the session 23 lecture is on IRS ethics. We are really coming near the end here. Okay, everyone, hello and welcome to our course on IRS ethics rules governing CPAs, enrolled agents, and tax return preparers, registered tax return preparers to be specific, but actually, of course, all tax preparers who receive a fee for preparing tax returns are governed by these rules, whether or not they are registered tax return preparers. If you are new to our webinars, but to start today's class, I wanted to show you this Ziggy cartoon. And this Ziggy cartoon came to me back in at the end of this past tax season. We were rolling out after April 17, 2011 tax season, and someone in my office found this cartoon and gave it to me. And I thought, what an excellent way to start a conversation on ethics. And of course, the cartoon it reads that Ziggy is at the IRS auditor's office, and the secretary is saying, sir, that little guy you're going to make an example of is, of is here. Shall I send him in? And my thought about the Ziggy cartoon was, did Ziggy prepare his own tax return, or did he use a paid tax professional? <laughs> because, of course, <clears throat> about 50% of the population does their own, and 50% of the population does use a paid professional. And our job as a paid professional is presumably to get the tax return done correctly and to give our client good support during an audit. But <laughs> Ziggy's there by himself, the poor dear. So either he did it himself, or he didn't think to bring his tax preparer with him, or maybe the tax preparer didn't want to go. But from an ethics standpoint, there's a couple of things I wanted to mention. And one of those was that in 2008, the uh, General Accounting Office did a review of the tax preparation industry. And I will come back to that particular review a little bit later in our course. But one of the things the review did is it published IRS statistics on the accuracy rates of filed tax returns. And do you think Ziggy's likelihood of having an accurate tax return is higher if he uses a paid professional or lower if he uses a paid professional? In other words, is a person who prepares their own tax return more likely to prepare the return correctly themselves than if they use a paid professional? The interesting thing is that according to the General Accounting Office study that reviewed the statistics, the accuracy rate of paid professional returns was lower. <laughs> than it was for self-prepared returns. 
Now, there can be all kinds of reasons why the statistics would come out that way. It could be that paid professionals, on average, prepare much more complex returns. Um, or it could be that when a person comes to use a paid professional, they're not as truthful. Maybe they're less conservative when they use a paid professional because they think they can use that paid professional as leverage. Who really knows what causes the statistic, but the statistic is what it is. So with that in mind, let's move on then <laughs> with a conversation of tax preparer ethics. And I'm about to load a manual on the screen in front of you that you should have already uh, printed yourself. And this manual exists inside the learning management system. It is there for you to print. It's a lengthy manual, 72 pages uh, long. And if you have not already sent it to your printer, it would take quite a while for it to come out. But this is a four-hour class. And if you want to go to the LMS and set it printing, that is just fine. Now, one of the things that IRS says about an ethics class is that the ethics class should at some point have time for classroom, and, uh, classroom discussion, where uh, students are asked probing questions that are designed to get them to think about ethics issues in the real world. And one of the things I'm notorious for is actually never finishing a class as quickly as I would like. And I usually end up cutting classwork short. And yet Iris says for an ethics class, we need to be sure to include these uh, discussion topics. So I'm going to go all the way to the end of the manual right now. It's just clocking forward a bit. And if you have the manual already printed, and you can flip to these pages, beginning on page 70 of the manual, that would be great. See, I have a printout right here. And on the screen in front of you, I'm now showing you the group discussion topics. And I'm going to read through the group discussion topics, not to ask for group discussion right now, but to get you thinking about these topics as we proceed through today's class. So beginning with the first group discussion, question number one, Jessica is a registered tax return preparer. She is interviewing a new tax client named George to collect information required to complete his tax return. George is self-employed and operates a small consulting business from his home. He presents a P&L for his business to Jessica with the following items reported on it. And the first item is his income, $150,000. And of course, I do want you to, draw, or to think about the fact that he runs a small consulting business. And of course, most consultants just work for themselves, right? They don't have a staff. But it is possible he has a staff. But bear in mind, it is not too likely that he does. And let's take a look at his expenses. He has advertising, auto, consulting, education, internet, a category called miscellaneous for $10,000, rent. 15,000, payroll 70,000, supplies 10,000, taxes 10,000, travel and meals 15,000, utilities 1,500, and when he's all said and done, he ended up with a loss of $4,000. Now, as a tax professional, are there any questions we should be asking George, or would it be simply OK to take this P&L and prepare a tax return with no more questions being asked? And if you were to ask questions, what are some of the questions you would ask? So I'm not going to ask you to tell me what those are right now, but if they come to you throughout today's four-hour class or during our breaks, I would like you to revisit this problem and think of some of the questions you might ask George. Question number two, Jack is an enrolled agent. He is preparing a tax return for John, who filed bankruptcy during the year. John wants to claim a deduction for attorney fees he paid. Now, what kind of questions should you be asking um, if you were Jack of this particular customer? And number three, considering IRS ethics rules surrounding best practices with respect to giving tax advice, how would you respond to a client who makes the following statement? I received some unemployment during the year, but I don't know how much. I just want to leave that off my tax return and deal with it next year. We've never heard that before, have we? <laughs> Question number four, what thoughts does this cartoon bring to your mind regarding tax preparer competency and ethics requirements? Now, this particular cartoon I have to take credit for. Um, I created it uh, conceptually. I had an artist working for me who I had draw the pictures. But the, the idea behind the cartoon is based on my own many years of experience working in this industry. And it has, of course, the tax preparer. And it has the tax client. And the tax preparer says, your refund is $150. And you can see that the computer is telling him it's $150. 
And the client says, but my refund was 2500 last year. Why is it so low this year? And the tax preparer says, well, my computer says the refund is $150. And the client says, but why? And the tax preparer says, because we have the best software out there, implying that if the software says it's 150, then it is. And he doesn't even need to know why, because the computer said it was 150. And of course, then we have this little sign in the window saying computer crippled tax service. Now, some people might find this ad a little bit offensive, and I can appreciate that. But at the same time, I've been in this industry for 20 years. And in the 20 years, I've employed over 200 tax preparers. And one of the things that goes on in our company is we review the return of every single tax preparer who works for us. It's actually a requirement under Oregon law, which is why we do it. We do it to be in compliance with the law, but we also do it to be in good practices, to know that we have ethical, competent tax preparers working for us. And I can tell you that in the past 20 years, having employed as many people as I've had, I've had tax preparers working for me who I would refer to as computer cripples, that they really don't understand what they're doing. And when the computer gives them an answer, they don't know why it's saying that or what could possibly have contributed to the outcome where the computer said that. Now, if I'm managing such a preparer and my preparer does not know what, when, or how the computer arrived at an answer, am I exercising best practices by employing that preparer? That's the question. Number five, Selena, a CPA, has prepared a tax return for her client that includes a loss from a publicly traded partnership, or PTP, on a Schedule K-1. Selena observes that her software is allowing the loss to be claimed and is unsure if it should be allowed. What should she do? Question number six, Fred, a registered tax return preparer, works in a franchise tax office. He also runs his own Amway business, and Fred routinely invites tax clients to come to his Amway meetings. Is there anything in Circular 230 or other regulations that addresses this particular practice on his part? And of course, I'm going to be reading you from uh, the Circular 230 regulations today, so I'm not expecting you right here and now to give me your opinion for your thoughts on the answers to any of these questions. Rather, I just felt it would be a good way to introduce ourselves to today's class. Ethics is something I actually like. To, I like talking about taxes in general. I, I just like to talk, and taxes are as good a thing to talk about as anything. But when we get into ethics, this really comes home to me because working in a tax business, we can approach ethics with fervor. We can uh, approach ethics with a blasé attitude. We can approach ethics with, I don't care about ethics. I'm going to do what I want. I mean, there's every manner of tax preparer out there and how we approach ethics is, of course, going to be personal to us. But I'm a little bit of a, a black and white person. Uh, I understand there's gray in the world. Uh, but at the same time, you're either doing the correct thing or you're doing the incorrect thing in most situations. And as soon as you put your interests ahead of your client's interests, then I think you're in the wrong. And if you want to be in the right, you need to do the ethical thing at all times. So there's this concept of what's right and what's wrong, am I an ethical person or an unethical person? And we can look to that. We can even look at it religiously and spiritually. But there's more to ethics than just whether you feel good about what you're doing or whether you felt that you were in compliance with a certain ethical standard. The other side of ethics is that the IRS has provided a whole series of rules that we operate under. And we can be acting very ethically as individuals, but be out of compliance with ethics rules simply because we don't know what they are. So for that reason, the IRS requires tax professionals who are governed by the IRS and not otherwise falling under some agency like attorneys and CPAs. Attorneys and CPAs, of course, have their own CPE requirements. But enrolled agents and registered tax return preparers have to take two hours of ethics every year. And people often say, how do you teach anyone to be ethical? You're either ethical or you're not ethical. But the reality is that the IRS has a whole series of rules, and we have to abide by those rules. And if we don't abide by the rules, we can be out of compliance with ethics laws. So that is what today's class is about. We're going to talk about all of the different rules out there that you have to follow. And you may not even have known that that was a rule. You may have done it anyway. Or maybe you weren't doing it because you didn't know you had to. So by the end of the class, hopefully I'll have taught you a few interesting things. 
Now, of course, most of IRS ethics are described in Circular 230. But in addition to reading the Treasury Department Circular 230 that you can see I'm highlighting right here, you also should be familiar with the content of a variety or a long list of other IRS documents, including IRS Publication 947, which uh, talks about practice before the IRS and power of attorney, Internal Revenue Code Section 6107, 6109, 6694, 6695, 6701, 7216, 7525, does anyone know, know what those are about? <laughs> we'll, we'll cover some of those so that you will know what they're about. Also, above and beyond those documents, you should really stay on top of uh, internal revenue bulletins and be reading them as they come out, because every once in a while, they address ethics issues. And in particular, I'm highlighting or going to refer during today's class to some internal revenue bulletins that contain relevant information including IRS Bulletin 2009-3, uh, 2010-46. We then have the Federal Register, September 30, 2010. More pages from that you should be familiar with. Notice 2011-6, Implementation of Rules Governing uh, Tax Preparers. Notice 2011-80, Guidance Regarding Obtaining and Renewing PTINs and CPE Requirements for Registered Tax Return Preparers. Notice 2011-89, Specifications for the Registered Tax Return Preparer Test. 26 CFR Part 300, User Fees, and a whole bunch of stuff related to e-file. And I'm going to be referring to most of those publications at some point during today's class. The overall objective of today's session is to cover provisions of regulations governing the practice of CPAs, enrolled agents, and registered tax return preparers that are now effective as of August 2, 2011. That was the date that the IRS issued the new Circular 230. And I was, of course, one of those people on pins and needles waiting for it to come out to see what it said. They took, it seemed, an eternity to publish it, but it did finally come out. And it's now been out for a full year. We're also going to look at national registration rules affecting all tax practitioners. and. If we have time, we will get into the IRS e-file mandate for 2012 and future filing seasons. If we don't have time to get into it, which is entirely possible given my prior history of teaching this class, the information is contained at the very end of this manual and you can read it in your own time. As an overview, the tax return preparation industry is comprised of a wide range of individuals and groups who assist taxpayers with the preparation of tax returns filing tax returns, and IRS representation. These individuals and groups include CPAs, attorneys, enrolled agents, enrolled actuaries, enrolled retirement plan agents, registered tax return preparers, and other unenrolled tax preparers who charge a fee for preparation services, unenrolled tax preparers who prepare returns for free, software developers, and government employees. The IRS historically has not regulated the preparation industry outside of authorizing and regulating preparers who fall under the provisions of Circular 230. And in previous versions of Circular 230, the IRS placed tax preparers into only two categories, preparers who were granted the authority to practice before the IRS and preparers who did not have the authority to practice before the IRS. There were simply two categories. And historically, the scope of Circular 230 governed the recognition of attorneys, CPAs, enrolled agents, and other persons representing taxpayers before the IRS. But the IRS has now expanded the scope of Circular 230 to a newly created category of tax preparer called a registered tax return preparer. In addition to the following regulations described in Circular 230, practitioners should be familiar with the provisions of IRS Publication 470, Limited Practice Without Enrollment. And a bunch of these other codes that I already mentioned on the front cover page. And in this case, and rather than just giving you the code, I've actually given you what the code description is. So Internal Revenue Code Section 6107 refers to tax preparer must furnish a copy of the return to taxpayer and must retain a copy or list. IRC Section 6109, Identifying Numbers. 6694, Understatement of Taxpayer's Liability by a Tax Return Preparer. 6695, Other Accessible Penalties with Respect to the Preparation of Income Tax Returns for Other Persons. 
6701, penalties for aiding and abating, uh, or aiding and abetting the understatement of a tax liability. IRC section 7216, disclosure or use of information by preparers of returns. IRC 7525, confidentiality privileges relating to taxpayer communications. IRC 7525, confidentiality privileges relating to taxpayer communications. Then we have Bulletin 2009-3, tax return prepare penalties under Section 6694 and 95. And finally, Internal Revenue Bulletin 2010-46, furnishing identifying number of a tax return preparer. And again, we're going to cover all of these in this course. There will be three breaks that we take during today's class. Each break will typically be close to the top of the hour, so if you do need to leave your desk, you'll be able to do so. And the break will last 10 minutes. I'll tell you when it's starting. I'll tell you when it's ended. Um, aside from those breaks, I will be giving some passwords. There will be three passwords that I'm giving out today. And if you are a webinar student, you must write that password down so that at the end of today's class, you can take the password test. The password test will prove you were in attendance. That means if you leave your desk when I'm giving a password and you don't hear the password, you can't get credit for today's class. So it's really important to listen for passwords and to write them down as I'm giving them. And who knows when I'm going to give a password. It will be whenever I feel like it, <laughs> and <clears throat> but it will not be during a break. But it could be immediately before a break, it could be immediately after a break, but it will not be during the break. So with that, on with our introduction. And again, I like to talk about history. History always interests me, so you'll see me refer to it quite often here. Historically, most tax professionals have been subjected to little or no government oversight. With the exception of tax preparers in the state of Oregon, which is where I am located teaching this class, and California, anyone could offer his or her services as a tax professional regardless of training, education, experience, or background. So what happened? Things are changing quite dramatically nationally, aren't they? Well, what happened was that there was a General Accounting Office study. And this study wasn't just a whim. This was a study that was a long time in coming. The IRS had been looking at national registration for a long time. And how do I know this? Well, I've been in tax return industry here in Portland, Oregon for 20 years. And in 2001, I decided to run a basic tax course. The reason I decided to do this is that Oregon law requires it. Uh, in Oregon, every person who wants to prepare tax returns for a fee must take an 80-hour course in basic tax law and then pass a state-administered examination called the Licensed Tax Preparer Exam. Once a preparer has passed that exam, they're eligible to be licensed. And after they get their license, they have to maintain it with 30 hours of continuing education a year. Now, Oregon considers this LTP license to be an apprentice level license. It allows a preparer to work under the supervision of a more experienced individual, typically a licensed tax consultant. And a licensed tax consultant is an individual who has worked for a minimum of two years and 1,100 hours and then passed a higher level examination, a much more difficult examination. And in Oregon, we compare the LTC exam to the individual portion of the enrolled agent exam, but typically we say our exam is harder. <laughs> but the enrolled agent exam covers, of course, estates, trusts, uh, partnership, corporation law, a broader range of topics, whereas the Oregon LTC exam covers only uh, individual tax law, including self-employment tax law. Uh, but we like to think of our test as more difficult. So what does all this mean? Well, what happened as a result of these laws that Oregon has had, and Oregon has had these laws for 40 years now, 30, 39, if you want to be precise. Um, it's created a shortage in Oregon. It is difficult to find licensed tax preparers. And we kind of have a joke, if, if they have a license, we'll give them a shot. Or at least historically, if they had a license, we'd give them a shot just to see whether they could actually do it. Because we couldn't just hire anyone. They had to have a license. So it did lead to a shortage. And therefore, the only way I could address this shortage was to run a tax school and try and produce my own graduates who I could then hire. It was the only strategy available to me. And in 2001, I did that. And at that time, I went to a board meeting with the Oregon Board of Tax Practitioners. And at this meeting, the board indicated that the IRS had paid them many visits over the years to see how we did things here in this state. So 
So way back as early as 2001, I was aware that the IRS was researching how we do things here in Oregon. But in 2008, it really came to a more focused investigation. And that investigation was done by the GAO. And the GAO is a government agency whose job it is to see how money is spent and whether it is being spent effectively. It's generally considered to be a well-regarded agency. So in August of 2008, the GAO published the results of its investigation into the tax preparation industry in its report to the US Senate Committee on Finance. The document was called Tax Preparers, Oregon's Regulatory Regime may lead to improved federal tax return accuracy and provides a possible model for national uh, regulation. The GAO report provided the following information in a summary of its findings. And this is, it's a, it's a lengthy report. It's a really interesting report to read. I've got the link here for it if you want to read it all. But I'm going to just give you some of, a bit of the introduction in that report. Firstly, why did GAO do the study? Well, millions of taxpayers use paid return preparers, and many of these paid preparers are not, su not subject to any qualification requirements. Paid preparers in California and Oregon are exceptions in that these states have set paid preparer qualification standards. To help Congress better understand the potential cost and revenue effects of regulating paid preparers, the GAO was asked to study how the IRS, California, and Oregon, and other states regulate paid preparers, how the accuracy of federal tax returns from California and Oregon compares to other returns, and how much it costs Oregon and California to administer those programs. Is there a cost-benefit ratio? Um, you know, if a certain amount of revenue is going to be saved uh, because tax returns are more accurate, is those savings going to be offset um, in part or completely by the additional cost imposed on the preparer or the regulation of those preparers? So the GAO analyzed IRS research data on tax return accuracy, interviewed IRS uh, officials, state administrators, and the preparer community, and reviewed relevant documents. And here is what it found. According to the GAO's analysis of IRS tax year 2001 research program data, Oregon returns were more likely to be accurate, while California returns were less likely to be accurate compared to the rest of the country after controlling for other factor, factors that were likely to affect accuracy. In dollar terms, the average Oregon return required approximately $250 less of a change in tax liability than the average return for the rest of the country. And for Oregon's 1.56 million individual tax filers, this equates to over 390 million more in federal income taxes paid in Oregon than would have been paid if the returns in this state were as accurate as similar returns in the rest of the country. Well, I thought that was pretty interesting because 390 million is actually a pretty big number, and we're a very small state population-wise. So uh, what would that equate to for the rest of the country if every tax return were as accurate in the rest of the country as they are in Oregon? That's one question. The next question is, we're more accurate, so we pay more? <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't seem fair. We should pay less by being more accurate. No, but from, from the standpoint of our government, that was a relevant thing. Now, the IRS decided to take charge, and in June 2009, it launched a review of the oversight of federal tax return preparers. The IRS held open meetings with constituent groups and received written comments in response to a request for input on standards for the tax preparer community. Essentially, what happened is the IRS went around the country, 2009, you may remember it, and they had meetings, forums, where people who are tax preparers, people who are taxpayers, could come and give their input. And a lot of input was provided, and the vast majority of the input was, we want to see regulation. And so, in January of 2010, the IRS published a report proposing new registration, testing, and continuing education requirements for paid tax preparers. While drafted as proposed regulations, the IRS has worked carefully to ensure it has the ability to implement and enforce the regulations. So it is not the regulation of tax preparers that was actually being proposed at that time. It was just the final shape of what those regulations would look like. And it's, it's, a, it's not a finite or defined thing at this point. The IRS is still changing the regulations. It'll come up and this will be a regulation that we want to implement. And then the tax preparer community will say, we hate it, we love it, 
uh, anywhere in between. And the IRS will then have to sit back and decide, are we going to implement this? Are we going to postpone it? Are we going to change it somehow? So at this point, we can already see how the IRS proposed certain standards, and then some of those standards have changed. But what hasn't changed is the regulatory side of things. We are being regulated, and we are being regulated in a brand new, entirely different way than has ever been the case in the past. How strict that regulation is, what it means for our industry in the long run, is still unknown. But it is a rather exciting time, for good or for bad, depending on your point of view. So what are the new IRS standards? Well, the IRS is enforcing a variety of new standards, and each standard is being phased in as the IRS is able to successfully implement it. So there could be a proposed regulation that the IRS is not implementing now because it can't do it. It's too early. It hasn't figured out how to do it. But it doesn't mean it won't eventually happen. And we can see some of them have been pushed off. Some of them have already been implemented. Some of them have been changed. The first of these is that all paid tax return preparers are required to register with the IRS pay a registration fee, and obtain a prepare tax identification number, or PTIN. Next, we have the competency tests that are required of all paid tax preparers except attorneys, CPAs, and enrolled agents who are active and in good standing with their prospective licensing agencies. The IRS started the initial testing of tax preparers in December of 2011. And currently, the IRS has stated that the following individuals are exempt from the test. Firstly, tax preparers who do not prepare Form 1040 series returns. Certain non-signing preparers who work underneath the supervision of an EA or attorney. The IRS will continue to listen to feedback from the tax preparer community and is still considering whether preparers who work for CPAs and EAs will be required to pass a competency test. The IRS is also considering plans to offer competency tests covering non-1040 series returns, such as 941 payroll returns, and forms 1065 and 1120 series returns. So these are conceptual things right now. The 1040 series test is in play. We know it's happening. People can take it. They can pass or fail it at this point. Uh, but the IRS is looking to a future where it will have possibly multiple tests. Will it ever come to that? We don't know. But it's a possibility that we have to look forward and say, hey, maybe five years from now, there will be a 941 test. Maybe 10 years from now, there will be a test for every category of return out there. It's going to take a while, but we'll eventually see what unfolds. Continuing professional education of 15 hours per year must be obtained by all registered tax return preparers except attorneys, CPAs, enrolled agents, certain supervised preparers, and non-1040 preparers. That's where we sit right now. The IRS has the flexibility to decide who has to have CPE. And right now, this is who has to have CPE and who doesn't have to have CPE. But that, again, can change. The IRS could say at some future point that everyone has to have CPE. And uh, people who are currently exempted could be forced to take it at some point in the future. Also, PTINs must be renewed between October 15, roughly, and December 31 each year. IRS Notice 2011-80 provides that the 15-hour continuing education requirement for certain tax return preparers will take effect starting in 2012. That means in order to renew your PTIN for 2013 filing season, People who are not exempt from the requirement, that is people who are not CPAs, EAs, attorneys, or people who are working for them, um, will have to have CPE in play at some point in 2012 or they won't be given a PTIN for 2013. Registered tax return preparers and individuals required to pass the registered tax prepare competency exam before December 31, 2013 must also complete that 15-hour requirement prior to renewing their PTIN for 2013 and sub subsequent years. Next, the IRS is going to conduct tax compliance checks on all tax return preparers. Tax preparers who are not in compliance will not be registered and will not be permitted to prepare tax returns. So this is essentially a keep your own house in order rule. Uh, IRS uh, rationalizes, and I think quite logically, that if a tax preparer cannot keep their own tax returns filed and keep up on their own tax returns and tax obligations, how can they be trusted to prepare tax returns for other people? So if you are a tax preparer, you need to make sure <laughs> your own house is in order or you may be out of business. Collection of fingerprints for suitability check. 
As part of the suitability check, certain PT applicants will be required to be fingerprinted for purposes of performing a background check. Now, there was a bunch of hoopla about this. A lot of people didn't like the concept of having to pay for a uh, fingerprint check, um, that it was going to be expensive, it was going to be burdensome. There was all kinds of uproar over this topic. And so on December 16th, there was a news release that came out, and it says, IRS continues oversight as OPR refines its focus. You can read that entire release if you want by clicking on the link contained in this document. And in it, the IRS says, it has relented on a controversial proposal in proposed regulations that mandated fingerprinting of anyone in the PTIN accepted agent or authorized EVE provider program. Practitioners found the requirement burdensome and expensive. And I can remember last November, I was at an IRS um, tax practitioner liaison here in Portland, Oregon. David Williams was present at that, and there was a lot of furor in the room over this particular requirement. And you can see less than a month later, or approximately one month later, the IRS relented on this particular proposal. But it doesn't mean it's gone forever. It just means that they're considering all options before this or some other measure is implemented. So this is a wait and see. And so far, since December 13, there's no more news that I've found. Next, all paid tax return preparers must be at least age 18. You're not allowed to be paid to prepare tax returns unless you're 18 or older. That's a new one. Circular 230 ethics standards are extended to cover all preparers. The IRS has placed all signing and non-signing tax preparers under Treasury Department Circular 230. The authority granted to those individuals who do not have professional licenses and who are not enrolled agents, enrolled actuaries, or enrolled retirement plan agents will be limited to preparing tax returns and representing their clients during an examination of any return prepared by the tax preparer. Tax return preparation software. In its return preparer review, the IRS stated that it will establish a task force that seeks the input of the tax preparation software industry, state government representatives, and other relevant stakeholders to address identified risks associated with the dependence of the tax administration on consumer and commercial tax preparation software, and discuss the possibility of establishing industry standards. Well, this, this is one that got my interest a lot. Because, of course, I've been using tax software for 20 years now. And uh, tax software sometimes doesn't work quite the way we think it should. Sometimes it's because the preparer doesn't know what they're doing. Sometimes it's because the software has a bug. Um, sometimes it's because the tax preparer doesn't actually stop to look at the finished product, just punches in numbers, clicks process. The computer gives a result, and the tax preparer never looks at it, analyzes, thinks their way through it. Um, and that happens a lot. I think every person in attendance today has at least once in their lives processed a return, looked at a finished result, and not thought about it. <laughs> Said, okay, that's it. Um, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And should the tax preparation or the tax software industry fall under some kind of regulatory oversight that ensures minimum levels or minimum standards are maintained? I think that they should just because of the types of errors that I see come out of tax software. But an interesting thing, again, came up at that same tax practitioner liaison that I was at in November of 2011. There was a woman from the local office of the Internal Revenue Service here in Oregon. Her name was Marty Van Dyke, or Margaret Van Dyke. And uh, she's in charge of their examination department. And although some of us might think of examination as a test, her examination department is, of course, the department that does audits on people's tax returns. So when she's doing an examination, she's, she's auditing a return. Her department is auditing a return. And her job on that particular day was to get up and give a presentation on how they select a tax return for audit, the types of abnormalities that they look for or things that stand out that make that tax return worth taking a look at. And just while she was up there, someone asked, a question about tax software, somehow she ended up on the, to the topic of TurboTax. And her comment was, TurboTax is a problem. Get rid of it. <laughs> and I thought, that's pretty interesting. She's in front of over 300 tax professionals in a public forum that probably has a reporter in there somewhere taking notes. And she said that? That's, that's pretty interesting. She's obviously pretty comfortable saying that. It's probably something she says a lot, and it just came out at that time. So 
So why would she say that? Do people ever blame TurboTax for their mistakes? Didn't Jeffrey Geithner do that? <laughs> he blamed TurboTax for the problem on his tax return. And it's pretty easy for us as tax preparers to blame our software for an error we made. And is that just and fair that we should do so? Marty thinks TurboTax is such a big problem that people shouldn't even be using it. Now, is that all tax software, or is that just software in the hands of an unlicensed, untrained person? That would be your average tax, uh, individual who is preparing their own tax return. So anyway, the IRS has said it's going to look at this. Maybe not now, maybe not today, but sometime soon, as I would guess, when that's going to happen. Next up was the refund settlement products. The IRS has also stated that it would convene a working group to review the refund settlement product industry. Part of this review will include analyzing opportunities to uh, improve the refund delivery uh, options. Now, of course, 2012 filing season was the last hurrah for the refund anticipation loan programs as we know them. There's been certain noise that I have observed that Companies who want to continue offering refund anticipation loans no longer have the option of working with national banks. Republic Bank was the last bank to offer these refund anticipation loans nationally. The IRS sued Republic Bank and told them to stop it. And Republic Bank has stopped as of the end of the 2012 filing season. So what that means is at a national level, there are no RAL banks for the 2013 season. However, there's certainly been a lot of noise um, on the internet about what some of the national franchises are doing and possibly some smaller uh, independent tax services are doing as well to look at the state level for banks who might be willing to do these loans. Maybe they can't do it at a national level, but within a particular state there's different regulation and maybe they'll be able to pull it off. I've even heard talk about going to banks located on Indian reservations and seeing what can be done there. So who knows? We may hit the 2013 season and see or hear that some tax return preparers are able to offer some kind of a RAL product. And of course, I'm referring only to the refund anticipation loan here. And a loan is where a tax client will receive a loan against their refund and not the actual refund. There's a second kind of product that we refer to as a RAC or a refund anticipation check or a similar product that allows the tax client to have his or her fees withheld from, the, from their refund. And then they will be issued a check at the time that refund comes in. This is different than a loan. So a RAL would be your loan, and a RAC would be not a loan. And uh, it's, everything's in order for RACs for 2013. That particular product is not going away. It'll be around. But of course, RACs again involve the uh, third-party banks. And uh, uh, an individual tax service operator cannot do a RAC in their own name. They have to use a third-party bank. And that's part of one of the IRS requirements is that a, a tax preparer cannot receive their client's refund. So in order for a tax preparer to have his or her fee withheld from a client's refund, that involves the middleman bank. The middleman bank receives the refund, withholds the fee, issues a check to the client, and then uh, the tax preparer re receives that fee as well. Well, there's a number of people, me included, who would love to see the middleman bank just eliminated from the picture entirely. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if there couldn't be a way for the IRS to do this themselves, that we could file a tax return for a client uh, with the IRS, and that the IRS would withhold a reasonable fee and send that directly to the tax preparer and then issue the client's check to the client or do a direct deposit to the client. And it was Nina Olson who is a national taxpayer advocate who was really pushing this particular concept. She liked it. She was making it a priority. But unfortunately, it is dead and <laughs> not going anywhere. In a statement released January 28, 2011, David Williams, who is director of the IRS Return Preparer Office, said that after receiving input from stakeholders, including consumer advocates and industry groups, the agency, that is the IRS, has decided against providing this particular option. So for the foreseeable future, RACs will continue to be around. RACs involve a middle party bank, but they do allow a preparer to have a fee withheld. However, the RAL program is dead unless at some smaller statewide level uh, of company is able to make that product come available. The next item we're going to talk about is public awareness and service enhancements. And this is something I like. 
One of the things that we've dealt with here in Oregon is that Oregon tax preparers are licensed. We're, we're regulated, much more uh, heavily regulated in Oregon than anywhere else in the country, and certainly uh, more stringently regulated than what IRS is now doing. And the problem with that isn't so much the regulation itself, is that the Oregon Tax Board has done a very, very poor job over the last 40 years of making the public aware that it even exists. And if a tax client is having a problem with their tax preparer here in Oregon, who do they complain to about it? Well, they can go to the tax board. Do they know that? Odds are they've never heard of the tax board. They've heard of the IRS. They've even heard of the Oregon Department of Revenue. But the tax board, they haven't heard of it. So the tax board has been there doing what it does for the past 40 years, which is tracking down illegal practices or illegally practicing tax preparers and fining them, putting them out of business. Um, but by and large, I think that there's a great deal of oversight that just doesn't happen here because the public doesn't know that they can complain or who to complain to. So when the IRS published its return preparer review, it mentioned that it would have public awareness and service enhancements be a part of its new mission. And I thought, hot dog. And here's what they have to say. The IRS will develop a public awareness campaign to educate taxpayers and paid tax return preparers and IRS employees about the new standards and requirements for tax return preparers. The IRS will develop a searchable database of tax return preparers who have registered and passed the competency examination. The IRS will promote this database and encourage the public to use the database to verify a tax preparer is registered and in good standing. Well, this particular database is not yet available, but it is coming. So we can see a future not too far from now where the IRS could run a public service campaign with a message that says, is your tax preparer registered? Visit this database and find out. And then, of course, if you're working as a tax preparer and someone does a search in there and you're not listed, they might presumably go find another tax preparer and or B, report you for practicing without being registered. The IRS has also stated that an enrolled agent is distinctly different from a registered tax preparer and as such will work to educate the public as to the difference between an enrolled agent and a registered tax preparer. So I just uh, had my artist uh, in our company do up another cartoon because I had this vision of what that world might look like, an idyllic world where we are working as paid professionals, whether we're a registered tax return preparer, CPA, enrolled agent, or this other group called unlicensed, untrained, unqualified. I refer to those as the UUUs. <laughs> we don't want to be in those UUUs, right? We want to be one of these three categories. And the IRS, at some point in the future, says it will begin to educate the public on these categories so that the public, the consumer, can stand back and make an educated decision about where to go. So the bottom line is that if you are registered as a tax preparer, you are a CPA, you are an enrolled agent, the public is going to be told to go to you and to avoid those people who are not licensed. So is there a win in this for the tax preparer? The legal tax preparer, yes, there is. Is there a lose in this for the UUU? I would hope so. But that's my biased opinion, of course. Now here is a summary of the current tax return preparer requirements. This chart comes right off of the IRS's website. It shows you the category of tax return preparers up there. Uh, and of course, we have enrolled agents, registered tax return preparers, CPAs, attorneys, supervised preparers, and a category called non-1040 preparers. Who among these people is required to have a PTIN? All of them. If you prepare any kind of tax return, you must have a PTIN. Of course, if you do it for a fee. Do you have to go through a tax compliance check? Yes, every category of PTIN holder is required to go through a tax compliance check. So what that means is, again, if you have not got your own house in order in terms of your tax responsibilities with the IRS, you may find that the IRS will not issue you a PTIN and you will not be able to prepare tax returns legally for a fee. Will you need to go through a background check? Well, this is that fingerprint check and we've got proposals pending because the IRS has not yet decided what it's going to do there. This, this background check is just proposals pending. We don't know who, how much, where, when, why is going to have to go through these proposals. But this is for the PTIN. 
you may still have to go through a background check for other reasons, such as you're applying for an electronic filing identification number or EFIN so that you can be an e-file provider, or if you're becoming an enrolled agent, you may still need to go through background checks for other reasons. But in terms of do I have to go through a background check to get a PTIN, right now it's pending, and the answer is no until they decide what that might be. IRS test. Does the category of preparer listed have to pass an IRS test? For an enrolled agent, the answer is, most cases, yes. It's called the C or Special Enrollment Exam. And today, that is a three-part exam. When I took it, it was a four-part exam. Um, does a registered tax return preparer have to pass an IRS test? The answer is yes, the RTRP test. But every other category of preparer listed does not need to pass an IRS test. Does the individual listed have to take CPE that is approved by IRS? And the answer is, if you are an enrolled agent, it's 72 hours every three years. And if you are a registered tax return preparer, it is 15 hours every year. CPAs and uh, attorneys vary, and that's because it varies according to the state. Some, I think there's even one state out there that doesn't require any CPA of, or CPE of uh, CPAs. One state I think I've heard of. But most states have a minimum requirement of around 40 hours a year. And IRS says, we'll go with that for now. Because those CPAs are already falling under state guidelines, we're going to, at least for now, accept that and not require more than that. And then we have a column called practice rights. Enrolled agents are considered to have unlimited practice rights. Registered tax return preparers have limited rights. CPAs and attorney have unlimited. And supervised preparers and non-1040 return preparers have limited practice rights. The next page I'm on is the Return Preparer Office Federal Tax Return Preparer Statistics. This data is current as of 6-1-2012, and it simply shows you the number of tax professionals out there who hold PTINs. As of 2012, that's 717,161 individuals hold PTINs. There was actually more than that initially, but the IRS has found that, all, that the initial number of people who registered for PTINs, there's quite a large number who did not renew that they got their first PTIN and they decided to heck with this and they did not renew. But of the 717,000 people, who are what source are they coming from? And we have attorneys making up 31,000, CPAs making up a little under 213,000. Enrolled actuaries are just this tiny little drop in the bucket. 537 people are enrolled actuaries. Enrolled agents, like myself, we make up a larger number, 42,895, but only slightly more than attorneys. I thought, thought that was interesting. And of course, CPAs are a much larger number of individuals than enrolled agents. Enrolled retirement and plan agents are another small group of 530. And here is this category called registered tax return preparers. At this point, as of June 2012, there are 4,893 registered tax return preparers in the country. A registered tax return preparer is someone who has taken and passed the RTRP test. We have another. 338,000 individuals who have been issued provisional PTINs who have not yet passed the RTRP test but will be required to do so within the next year and three months. Of course, by the end of 2013, all of these 338,000 people will have to pass the test unless they fall into a category of supervised tax preparers, of which there are 54,000 individuals, or non-1040 preparers, of which there are 42,000 individuals. And individuals who fall into one of these two categories either don't prepare 1040 returns at all, so it's not reasonable to ask them to take the test, or they work underneath the supervision of an attorney, CPA, or enrolled agent who is signing that tax return for them. Tax preparer registration requirement. Um, but I feel this is a really important section. And the reason this section is important is this particular section of law is what the IRS is using to regulate us. Um, without this particular provision, it would have been much more difficult for the IRS to come along and begin regulation, and let's see why. Internal Revenue Code Section 6109 authorizes the Secretary to prescribe regulations for the inclusion of identifying numbers on a return, statement, or other document required to be filed with the IRS. The IRS is using the provisions of this particular section to control tax preparer registration and compliance. And under the section, the IRS has the ability to require the use of an identifying number by the paid preparer and require that the identifying number be one that is issued by the IRS and set forth rules under which an identifying number will be issued and renewed. So 
So essentially what the IRS has done is it said, well, we've had this particular section in place for a considerable period of time now. I can remember when the first PTINs came out in the mid-90s, early to mid-90s, the first PTINs came out, and they were re in response to an outpouring of concern from the tax preparation community because we did not want to be putting our social security numbers on tax returns. It was in the infancy of identity theft, and people were starting to think about those kinds of things. So the PTIN was created at that time for those preparers who didn't want to put a social security number on the return. And what's happened is the IRS has used that particular provision of law that allows them to issue a PTIN, and now they're saying, we're going to use this ability to allow people to have a PTIN to basically require that they have a PTIN, and that we're going to control when and who can have a PTIN. So this particular provision of law is really how everything we know today is coming to pass. In 2010, the IRS published its final regulations addressing tax return preparer PTIN requirements. And I've got links here to those if you wish to read them. It provides instructions on how to apply for and receive a PTIN. And it also provides information on the fact that the IRS considers the uh, preparation of a tax return for compensation to now be a form of representation before the agency. And thus, the IRS has also amended the regulations in Section uh, 31 of USC 230 to specify that any person who prepares a tax return for compensation is practicing before the agency and therefore must demonstrate good character, good reputation, the necessary qualifications to enable that representative to provide valuable services, and competency to advise and assist persons in presenting their cases. Well, this is really rather a revolutionary thing, because up until the revisions to Circular 230 and until the IRS revised its rules about who could have a PTIN, there was no requirement that a tax preparer be competent. When you think about it, that's rather an amazing thing. Um, can any of us imagine going to see a doctor who had not graduated medical school? Would we consider that? Now, of course, in the days before there was a medical licensing, many doctors were referred to as quacks. If you go back and just read historical literature and news stories at the time, uh, anyone could call themselves a doctor and hold themselves out as a doctor. And, and uh, some doctors would have gone through schooling and some wouldn't. And how did you know if you had a licensed doctor or not when there was no such thing as licensing? So, Every profession really out there that is currently licensed at some point, probably in the past, was not licensed and went through an implementation process such as the one we're going through now. And the big thing that's happening now is IRS says you need to be competent. And we're assuming you're competent if you're an attorney or a CPA. Uh, if you're not one of those two things, then you'll need to pass a test to prove you're competent, either the C examination for enrolled agents or the registered tax preparer test for everyone else. So who is covered by the new PTIN registration requirement? Well, pretty much any paid tax preparer is now covered by the registration requirement. And anyone who does not already have a PTIN must get one before they uh, can begin preparing tax returns for a fee. And anyone who did have a PTIN prior to 2010 is being required to re-register and get that PTIN reissued. So there is more information in this particular part of the manual on Section 6109. I'm going to move past it to the next page, where there is a list of forms where you do not have to have a PTIN in order to be allowed to prepare them. So essentially, if you want to prepare a tax form for a client and be paid for the preparation of that form, you have to have a PTIN, unless the form is one of these forms listed here. So you can prepare tax, uh, a tax form for a fee without holding a PTIN if the form is one of the following forms listed here. And you will see, by and large, none of these have to do with preparation of a tax return of any kind. Um, 941 returns, for example, are not listed. 941s are the payroll returns that are filed by employers. And there's lots of companies out there that specialize in the preparation and filing of those forms. And those forms are not listed here. That means if all you do is payroll reports, you're still required to have a PTIN. So who is not required to have a PTIN? Well, you don't have to have a PTIN to file for a change in accounting method or to prepare W-2s. Those are the types of forms that are listed here. The next topic of the day is professional PTINs and PTIN renewals. 
Provisional PTINs are issued to individuals who are not attorneys, CPAs, enrolled agents, enrolled retirement plan agents, or enrolled actuaries. Individuals who receive a provisional PTIN must meet testing and or suitability requirements before a permanent or active PTIN can be issued to them. So what that means is if you are an attorney or an enrolled agent or a CPA and you go online and you go through the PTIN application process, you are given a real PTIN. Uh, every year you're required to renew it, but you're given a PTIN. If you're anyone else who is required to sit the registered tax return preparer test, you are given something called a provisional PTIN, and that provisional PTIN will say it's provisional until such point you pass the test, and then you will be given, well, a non-provisional PTIN. <laughs> now, initially, the IRS planned to cease issuing provisional PTINs when the RTRP competency test came online. So that theoretically would have been December of last year. Then it corrected itself and said, no, wait, 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 we'll give you until the end of tax season 2012, that is April 18, 2012, and after that point, we're going to stop issuing provisional PETINs. And then it further changed its mind again, and as we sit here right now, uh, the IRS does not know when it will stop issuing provisional PETINs, uh, and it will not publicly address this issue or give final determination on the end of this issue until as late as the end of 2013. So as we're sitting here right now, we don't know when they will start to stop issuing provisional PETINs. Um, when they do come to a decision on that, they will let us know. Um, if you are, there's a question I'm not talking about renewals. The answer is I am talking about initial PETIN and renewal PETINs. When you apply for your initial PETIN, if you are required to pass the RTRP test, that initial PTIN request will give you a provisional PTIN. And up until the point you pass the RTRP examination, you will continue to be issued provisional PTINs. You will not receive a permanent PTIN or a non-provisional PTIN until you've passed the test, if you are an individual who is required to take the test. Now notice 2011-80 provides guidance on, uh, regarding obtaining and renewing PTINs. And it includes information on the following topics. And it's divided into a series of sections. Section 1 states that the last date the provisional PETIN may be obtained, and they keep changing their mind. But it also states that provisional PETINs must be continually maintained through CPE and through payment of the annual fee. And beginning in 2012, the provisional PETIN holders must complete continuing education requirements. Section 2 provides guidance regarding PETIN, including provisional PETIN renewal. Section 3 provides that certain individuals must be fingerprinted and pass a suitability check. And Section 4 provides guidance regarding continuing education requirements for registered tax return preparers. Now, I do know a lot of the people in attendance in my ethics class today are CPAs who may be wondering, why do I have to listen to all of this monologue about RTRPs and so forth when it doesn't cover me? Well, actually, it does. Um, the, the rules regarding PTINs and the Registered Tax Return Preparer exam may not cover you directly as an individual CPA, but they will cover your business. And if you are supervising the work of any other tax preparer, these rules are highly relevant to you, and you should be fully aware of them so that you stay in compliance with IRS regulations on the people you supervise. Compliance check. As a part of the registration process, tax return preparers are also subject to a tax compliance check which includes a review of the tax preparer's history of compliance with personal and business income tax filings. The compliance check is not an audit of the return. They're not going to open it up and look at your tax return and, and decide whether or not you cheated or whether you underreported income or overclaimed deductions. That's not what they're looking at. They're examining the following facts. Did the preparer file a tax return if he or she was required to do so? Is the preparer current on tax payment obligations? So either the tax return, if the tax return showed you owed, did you pay it? And if you couldn't pay it, are you now on an installment plan and are you current on that installment plan? If a preparer has been audited, did he or she pay additional taxes owed or enter into an installment agreement? And a tax preparer who has entered into an installment agreement and is current with the agreement is deemed to be in compliance. And again, the IRS will not be doing audits per se, as a part of the PTIN registration process. But there's nothing to stop them from auditing for other reasons. Renewal period. PTINs must be renewed annually, with the annual renewal period running mid-October through uh, December 31. So renewals for 2013 
must be completed between October 15, which we estimate, and December 31, 2012. I was just on the IRS site as late as yesterday seeing if they've actually given us a real date where they're, where they're going to come online for renewals, and it just says mid-October. Uh, last year it was October 18th, because I believe the 17th or the 15th fell on a weekend. Um, so this year it doesn't fall on a weekend. One might hypothesize or theorize that it will become available on the 15th of October, but until it does, we can't give you a specific date. PTIN registration and renewal. The cost of an initial PTIN registration is $64.25. But if you're only renewing, you get to save yourself a whopping buck 25, and <laughs> you can renew for $63. If you are a paid preparer, you may not use your social security number in lieu of your PTIN on returns that you are paid to prepare, and do not write PTIN applied for in the section of a tax return that is only for the paid preparer use. You must have a PTIN. To apply for a PTIN, go to the IRS website. I've given you the link here on this page. Uh, if you haven't been to the IRS website in a few weeks, you may not have noticed that they've totally revamped the site. I have decided that I don't like it yet. Uh, of course, I don't like it when I go into a supermarket and they rearrange the aisles either, so I get used to things a certain way and how to find things. But they have revamped the whole site, so it may look a little different uh, when you go back. But there is a link here and where to go and how to apply for your PGIN re uh, renewal. For representation outside of the United States, foreign individuals must now also have a PTIN to be eligible to prepare tax returns for compensation outside of the United States. Uh, foreign persons who prepare U.S. tax returns for compensation that are not eligible for a Social Security number um, need to uh, complete Form 8946. And in addition, they also have to submit this Form W-12. Competency examination requirement. In late 2011, the IRS established competency testing procedures for all paid tax return preparers who are required to register with the IRS and are not otherwise exempt. And the following individuals are currently exempt from the test. Attorneys, CPAs, and enrolled agents who are active and in good standing with their licensing agency. Supervised preparers, that is those who do not sign a return, but are employed by an attorney, CPA, or other recognized firm, at least 80% owned by an attorney, CPA, or an enrolled agent, and who are directly supervised by an attorney, CPA, or enrolled agent. So what this is saying is you could be uh, an individual working inside a firm that employs a CPA, but is not 80% or more owned by a CPA. And in that situation, you would be required to pass the RTP, R, RTRP test. So it is only those individuals who work for CPAs, attorneys, or enrolled agents in a firm that is 80% or more owned by the same type of individual. Um, there's a question, what does H&R Block do? Well, H&R Block would not be exempt and would not be able to employ individuals who have not passed the test because they wouldn't be able to employ someone who is exempt from the test because H&R Block, of course, is not 80% owned by a CPA, although an individual franchise certainly could be 100% owned by a CPA. That's technically possible. <laughs> um, okay, so that was just a question in the classroom. And, of course, you are exempt from testing if you prepare no Form 1040 series returns. In Publication 4832, Return Preparer Review, the IRS states that will assess the quality of return preparation by those who are exempted from the testing, for example, attorneys, CPAs, enrolled agents, to determine whether there is a need to expand competency testing to include those individuals in the future. So at this point, the IRS is saying, we're not going to test CPAs and attorneys. We're not going to require you to pass a test to get a PTIN, but they've left the door open for the future. And they do have the ability, they may not implement it right now, but you can, you can see that if they collect enough information, in uh, the registration of a PTIN, you're going to identify yourself when you're registering for a PTIN as being a CPA, an attorney, an enrolled agent, or someone who is uh, going to be required to sit the test. You would identify yourself as that. You'd be issued a PTIN, and now your PTIN is going on every return you prepare. It is not hard to conceive of a future where statistics can be taken of all the returns being prepared out there. And will those statistics reveal that one category of preparer is more or less accurate than another category of preparer? I would think that ability is there. And if the ability is there and analysis shows that a particular category of preparer has a very high error rate, um, one could see where that might cause the IRS to say, hey, this category that initially did not require testing now could require testing. 
For the test, the IRS has selected Prometric as the vendor to administer the new test. It must be completed at a Prometric testing center. The fee to take the test is $116. And you can learn more about what to expect on test day by watching Prometric's video. And this is a link. You can watch it on YouTube, what to expect on test day. David Williams, when I was at the uh, tax practitioner liaison last November, was talking about how they had selected Prometric and that Prometric was pretty much an expert at everything people did to cheat and having safeguards in place to prevent cheating. For example, when you go into a Prometric test center, you have to take all of your personal belongings that are accompanying you and lock them in a locker. You're not allowed to take them into the examination room. And uh, every computer terminal uh, that is operating the test is going to have a different test. And you may be in a Prometric te testing center taking the RTRP exam, and the next terminal over, someone is taking a test on a completely different field of study, nothing to do with taxes at all. So it, what would mean then is even if you entered the testing center with another individual, and uh, you said to that individual, um, what is your answer to question number three? Their question number three is probably not the same as your question number three. So first off, they don't allow talking in the examination center. But even if they did allow talking, uh, you're not going to be taking the next same test as the person standing next to you. Password number one is Gollum, G-O-L-L-U-M, Gollum. Supervised preparers, um, notice 2001-6, supervised preparers and non-1040 preparers. This particular notice provides information to help determine which preparers are considered to be supervised and who are non-1040 preparers. And I'll leave you to read that if you feel that that category is important to you. Certain supervised preparers who do not have to take the exam, the IRS has decided to allow certain individuals who are not attorneys, CPAs, or enrolled agents um, to obtain a patent and prepare or assist in the preparation of all or substantially all of a tax return in certain discrete situations. All of these involve uh, individuals who are working directly under the supervision of an attorney, CPA, or an enrolled agent who will ultimately sign the return. Again, there was a big uproar, particularly from some of the state boards of accountancy, not the state boards of accountancy, but the societies of CPAs. So the boards of accountancy, I don't think, were really a part of the uproar at all. It was the associations that CPAs belong to, possibly some attorney ones, but mainly what I was reading about and hearing about were um, organizations, particularly through AICPA, I think the Pennsylvania Society of CPAs. There, there was a number of groups that were very much in an uproar about the concept that they, as practicing CPA firms, would have to go through undue burden and extra cost to enable their interns to prepare tax returns, and that just wasn't equitable. And uh, so initially, the IRS did not intend on exempting these types of individuals, but for the time being is exempting them. I mentioned my opinion on this matter to David Williams <laughs> when he was here in November. I said, you know, that is just balderdash. Uh, you know, here in Oregon, Everybody has to pass a test and get a license. And I can tell you for 20 years, my preparers have been doing it. It is not an undue burden. And CPAs typically charge more than a normal, you know, a smaller firm like ours, an independent firm like ours that just does tax returns. So how can they claim they cannot do what we've shown in Oregon we can do successfully for 40 years? And his comment to me was, I couldn't agree with you more. However, <laughs> baby steps. And they're going to, that. they really want to get the Peaton rules and the competency test rules established nationally for the biggest pool they can, which is the majority of tax preparers out there. And after that's fully implemented, then they can sit back and say, hey, should we really be exempting any particular group? So as we sit right now, it does not look like they will require these supervised preparers to take the test. However, that can change as time progresses. And moving on again. There is a provision that the IRS has gone out of its way to publicize over the past several years. 
And that is what happens when you have multiple individuals preparing a tax return that only one of them will sign. How does the IRS know who to go after? Because, of course, ultimately on any paid tax return, there is a PTIN entered on the return, needs to be a properly issued PTIN, and the individual whose PTIN that is needs to sign the return. And if you have an enrolled agent, a CPA or an attorney, who is signing a return that by and large they didn't prepare, they're just giving it a pen swipe because one of their exempted prepares, uh, prepared it for them, is there going to be any repercussion for that? Where is the IRS going to turn? And the IRS has stated that existing Treasury regulations provide that a signing tax return preparer is the individual preparer who has the primary responsibility for the overall accuracy of the preparation of the return. The PTIN requirements, re which require all preparers to register and obtain a PTIN, do not change the existing re rules regarding uh, who is the signing preparer. So ultimately, if you are a person who is employing individuals who have not passed the prepare exam, the IRS is still expecting that you provide them with adequate training. Because after all, you're putting your number on there. And if that tax return comes up with problems because you signed it, they can still come after you. And then non-Form 1040 series preparers, the IRS anticipates that the types of returns and claims for refunds covered by the examination may expand in the future. The IRS recognizes that certain compensated tax return preparers do not prepare Form 1040 series returns or related claims for refunds, and that the tax returns and claims for refund prepared by these individuals may not be covered by the competency tests for a significant period of time. And therefore, it's only fair that those individuals not have to take the test. And then moving on, the next topic I'm coming to is on page 19 of your man manual, and that is the competency examination content. Now here in Oregon, the Oregon Tax Board releases each year a list of the most frequently missed test questions from the prepare exam and the consultant exam. It also publishes a list of um, the weight different topics will have on the test. Um, the IRS's list of tested topics is very different. They do have a link or a place that you can go where you can take a sample test to kind of get a feel for what it's going to be like when you go take the test. But aside from that sample, practice test, they don't give you much more than this list of the domains that will be tested. They don't tell you the weight on each section. What they do say is that each question in and of itself is weighted. And that's why even though there's only 100 questions on the test, I believe you get a score out of five, is it 300, 500. There's, a, there's an actual higher, much higher number than there are numbers of questions. Because some questions are deemed to be easy questions and might only be worth one point, and another question might be worth five points. So if you miss a hard question, you could lose five points on the test. You get an easy question, it may only win you one point. Um, so they're saying that they're going to test these various domains, but how many questions and what weight of question is on any particular topic has not been released. IRS also has not released the pass rate for the RTRP test. So no one really knows how many people take it versus how many people pass it. Uh, that's a difference that we have here in Oregon. Oregon does pass, pass, provide pass rates on its tests. And to, for those of you who might be interested in what Oregon's pass rates are, even if you're not here, just to give you a general picture, the Oregon tax preparer test, LTP test, has an average pass rate of around 55% to 60%. And it's a semi-open book test. The preparers can bring in Pub17 and a few other publications. Uh, the RTRP test gives you an electronic copy of Pub17 that you can refer to while you're taking the test. But in talking to people who've had access to that Pub17 electronically, I've, I've heard that it's difficult to reference during the test, that it's not simple to look stuff up in it. But it is provided. The Oregon LTC exam has a pass rate of 25%. So considering that individuals who are sitting the LTP or the LTC exam have worked 1,100 hours over a minimum of two years, can only muster a 25% pass rate, um, it's telling you that a test can be made pretty difficult and that even years of experience may not get you to a point where you can pass. So going over to the registered tax return prepare exam, how hard is that test? What is the pass rate? That information simply is not being published. But we've certainly at our school here had lots of phone calls from people who said they took it and failed it. So now they're trying to figure out what they need to do to learn enough to pass it. Well, the first step in passing any test is making sure you have learned enough about the different topics being covered. And IRS has divided the test into different domains. 
And the first domain is just doing the preliminary work, interviewing your client, figuring out what they did last year, comparing last year's number to this year, figuring out what their filing status is, and so forth. We then go on to the different types of income in domain two, whether a form of income is taxable, how it's taxed. We then go into deductions and credits, what's deductible, what's not deductible, when does a person qualify for a deduction or credit, and when do they not. Domain four covers other taxes, such as the alternative minimum tax and self-employment tax. Domain five covers completion of the filing process. And the very first thing on the list is check the return for completeness and accuracy. So the IRS, at least here in my mind, is saying, you finished all the data entry, now you need to look at your work and make sure you didn't make a mistake. Uh, but if, how they're going to turn that into a test question remains to be seen. We then have practices and procedures. That's domain six. Now, domain six and domain seven really, in my mind, both have to do with ethics. Practices and procedures has to do with uh, negligence and uh, competence, uh, rules for the tax return preparer in terms of keeping copies and lists. And ethics really has to do with the contents of Circular 230. So in today's ethics course, we're covering practices and procedures. And we're also covering ethics. I just can't think that you can really have a conversation about ethics without also covering practices and procedures. And we are now moving on to Circular 230, practice before the IRS. This section of the course provides a summary of certain parts of IRS Circular 230. It is intended to highlight areas of concern to most tax practitioners. Circular 230 is presented as code and therefore can be difficult to read. That's in contrast to, say, Pub 17 or any of the other IRS publications that you would typically pick up and read. When you pick up an IRS publication, they've really done, in many cases, I think, a very good job of taking IRS code and making it into simpler language that one can read and take meaning from. No effort has been made to do the same thing with Circular 230. And in fact, I'm going to, if you haven't actually taken a look at Circular 230, I think I have it in here somewhere. That was my goal. Share. I loaded it. Now I don't see it. Over the next break, I'll grab Circular 230 and try and show it to you, because it takes a bit to load when I try and load something. But essentially, what I've done is I've read Circular 230. And with any course I ever teach on IRS ethics or IRS tax rules, I, I tend to read the instructions and say, OK, what do those instructions really mean when it comes to preparing a tax return? Um, and so for the manual that you have in front of you and the one that I'm reading from, this is my interpretation of what Circular 230 is saying. It's my interpretation of what's important in that circular that you really should know. But listening to me talk and reading my manual is not a substitute for reading the circular. It's not a replacement for reading the circular. And if you come to me and say, hey, April, you said this was the case and Circular 230 says something otherwise, well, thanks for letting me know. I will update my manual. But you shouldn't rely on my manual as the last word. It certainly won't hold up in front of an IRS um, practice hearing. Um, however, my hope is that by taking these rules and summarizing them that you'll lock on to what I think is important and it will match what the IRS thinks is important. So IRS says that practice before the IRS covers all matters relating to any of the following. Communicating with the IRS for a taxpayer regarding the taxpayer's rights, privileges, or liabilities under laws and regulations administered by the IRS. It also includes representing a taxpayer at conferences, hearings, or meetings with the IRS, preparing and filing documents with the IRS for a taxpayer, and corresponding and communicating with the IRS for a taxpayer. Now this particular one, preparing and filing documents with the IRS for a taxpayer, that's of course a relatively new addition. It did not used to be the case that preparing a document for the IRS was considered practice. So a big change is that when you prepare a document, it is now considered practice, including preparation of a tax return. But the following acts do not constitute practice before the IRS and can be conducted by anyone. They include furnishing information at the request of the IRS or appearing as a witness for the taxpayer. So let's take a look at 31 USC section 330, practice before the department. This is really the introduction to the new Circular 230. If you take the old Circular 230 and line it up to the new Circular 230, 
What was the first most apparent change? Well, the new Circular 230 begins with this introduction that you've got right here. And it says, subject to Section 500 of Title V, the Secretary of the Treasury may regulate the practice of representatives of persons before the Department of the Treasury and before admitting a representative to practice, require that that representative demonstrate good character, good reputation, the necessary qualifications to enable the representative to provide persons valuable services and competency to advise and assist persons in preparing their cases. So in other words, in summary, and when you see, when you see a normal font up here, this is because I'm taking it pretty much verbatim from Circular 230. When you see Italia, italics, this is my extra comments <laughs> or my opinion. In summary, the 2011 revision of Circular 230 now states that a tax return preparer is required to be knowledgeable and competent. And the ability to represent a taxpayer before the IRS is now considered to be a privilege and is no longer a right. Not that it ever was a right, but certain things that we didn't need to have permission of the IRS to do, including preparation of a tax return, we now have to have our IRS permission to do. So it used to be we thought we could prepare a tax return for anyone for a fee, and that was our right. And now, no, it's not a right. It's a privilege, like a driver's license, <laughs> right? <laughs> you turn 16, you're allowed to drive a car only if you have a license. So it's not a right. It's a privilege, and you have to be able to show that you've demonstrated enough competence by passing a written examination on traffic laws and a physical driving examination to show that you know how to operate the vehicle. Well, we could think of uh, tax repairs now being something similar to that. Also, the secretary may suspend, disbar, or censure a representative who is incompetent, is disreputable, violates regulations prescribed under this section, or with intent to defraud, willingly and knowingly misleads or threatens the person being represented or a prospective person to be represented. So in other words, what that's saying is, you cannot tell a person, you'd better pay me what I'm asking you for the preparation of your tax return, or I'm going to blankety blank blank. That's essentially what that's saying. Monetary penalty may be imposed upon the tax preparer. The secretary may impose a monetary penalty on a representative. And we'll show you a little bit later in today's class what some of those penalties are. Employer or firm may also be the subject of a sanction or penalty. If the representative was acting on behalf of an employer, a firm, or other entity in connection with the conduct giving rise to a penalty, the secretary may impose a monetary penalty on the employer, firm, or entity if it knew or reasonably should have known of the unethical conduct. The penalty shall not exceed the gross income derived or to be derived from the conduct that gave rise to the penalty, but it may be in addition to or in lieu of any suspension, disarmament, or censure of the representative. After notice and opportunity for a hearing to any appraiser, so this is interesting, where did appraiser come from? So really, uh, for the most part, you're, you are acting before the IRS or practicing before the IRS, that was the word I was looking for, you are practicing before the IRS when you prepare a tax return. So how did we get to this point where we have an appraiser? Well, it often happens when you're preparing a tax return or when the IRS is perhaps auditing a return that there may have been a need for an appraisal. Perhaps uh, we're looking at a t uh, one of the estate tax returns for figuring death tax, and that death tax is imposed on the valuation of an estate, so an appraiser would have come out and appraised that estate. Or it could be that you claimed a gift, uh, a deduction on a tax return for a gift that you donated to charity, and you're claiming a deduction based on the fair market value of that gift. So again, you had to have an appraiser if that gift was valued at 5000 or more. So in certain uh, limited situations, the IRS does oversee appraisers, and can ban an appraiser from making appraisals before the IRS if that appraiser does not behave. And then nothing in this section or in any other provision of law shall be construed to limit the authority of the Secretary of the Treasury to impose standards applicable to the rendering of written advice with respect to any agency. And then on Octo uh, basically February 22, 2012, uh, in line with this topic that I'm just talking about, there was a Tax Notes Today article that I read. And it's interesting to read Tax Notes Today and other news releases or press releases that come out of the Office of Professional Responsibility. Because they really, in many ways, 
enlighten you to what the IRS is thinking, where it's going. Because when we go into an audit with a client, or perhaps a client has reported us to the Office of Professional Responsibility and we're under investigation, we need to go into that with our eyes open and some level of awareness of what it is that is being investigated, the types of evidence that need to be brought forth. So I find reading these types of articles to be interesting and enlightening. And this particular one was very interesting. And the article was referencing uh, Karen Hawkins, who currently is the director of the Office of Professional Responsibility. And it said, although the IRS Office of Professional Responsibility has the authority to penalize practitioners or their firms through monetary sanctions, OPR Director Karen Hawkins has said that she is reserving the penalty and giving it to firms only. I'm saving it for firms because I don't want practitioners to ever get the impression that they can buy their way out of a disciplinary matter by throwing some money at me. Um, she says that she wants to penalize the firms because she thinks that's where monetary sanction will have the most impact. Now, under sec uh, Circular 230, OPR has the authority to impose a monetary penalty on practitioners or firms that engage in inappropriate conduct of up to 100% of the gross income derived or expected to be derived from the conduct. conduct. Hawkins has said that she plans to remain in office for only one more year. So even though it is her position that the monetary penalty should be imposed only on firms, her successor, whoever he or she is, could disagree and start assessing penalties on the individuals as well. We're now going to look at Section 10, Scope of Part, Subtitle A, Part 10, Section 31 of the Code of Regulations. And let's start with Subpart A. 10.1 talks about the offices. And essentially, today, there are two offices. The old Circular 230 referred only to the Office of Professional Responsibility. We now have more than one office. And there can be more than two offices. Currently, we have two. In the future, it could be more than two. But there was a big dramatic change that occurred in the last couple of years, and that is the formation of the Return Preparer Office. Up until then, we had only the Office of Professional Responsibility. So OPR is now responsible for enforcing Circular 230 standards only and will no longer oversee enrolling, testing, or administrative processing. These responsibilities have been transferred to the newly created Return Preparer Office. So OPR has the responsibility for matters related to practitioner conduct and discipline, including disciplinary procedures and sanctions, whereas the Return Preparer Office is responsible for implementing the new requirements and oversight of the IRS Return Preparer Program. So essentially, David Williams uh, is the man who is currently in charge of the Return Preparer Office, and Karen Hawkins is the woman who is the director of the Office of Professional Responsibility. So if you get a letter from OPR, uh, you're probably in trouble. <laughs> and if you get a letter from the Return Preparer Office, it may be uh, a notice that they're looking at you or it could be instructions on taking a test or related to a test. In another article, the BNA Daily Report press release that was issued by OPR on 224 of 12 provided the following information. It clarifies that the OPR's role and OPR has jurisdiction over the following individuals. CPAs and attorneys who practice before the IRS, all enrolled agents and enrolled retirement plan agents, enrolled actuaries, paid tax return preparers, and appraisers who submit appraisals supporting tax positions. It also describes the following four broad areas in which OPR might identify areas of misconduct by a tax practitioner. A tax practitioner can be engaging in misconduct when advising tax preparers on filing positions or transactions, or during taxpayer representation before the IRS, or on the practitioner's very own tax return, or through mix external misconduct or moral turpitude. Comments about per practitioner misconduct are referred to OPR. However, a tax practitioner's own tax compliance is checked by the Return Preparer Office, which will issue soft letters to non-compliant tax practitioners to urge them into compliance. The Return Preparer Office works in partnership with OPR, which is responsible for the Circular 230 conduct issues. The next part of the manual goes on to definitions, who is what. Um, I'm not going to read the definitions to you. I will leave you to do that on your own. And then uh, we come to section 10.3 on page 28 of the manual, who may practice. IRS says in Circular 230 that any of the following individuals can practice before the IRS. How any, however, any individual who is recognized to practice, 
a recognized representative must be designated as the taxpayer's representative by a power of attorney. And then it goes on to state that attorneys have to be in good standing with their licensing bodies, CPAs have to be in good standing with their licensing bodies, enrolled agents have to be in active status with IRS, the same with enrolled actuaries and enrolled in retirement plan agents, and then it goes on to register tax return preparers, where interestingly the paragraph is much longer. So I'll read it. Any individual who is designated as a registered tax return preparer pursuant to Section 10.4C of Circular 230, who is not currently under suspension or disbarment from practice before the IRS, may practice before the IRS um, and practice as an RTRP is limited as follows. These are important issues because whether you are an RTRP or whether you supervise RTRPs, you want to make sure that the RTRP is acting in compliance with these particular, particular limitations. And these limitations include that the preparer may prepare and sign tax returns and claims for refunds and other documents for submission to the IRS. A registered tax return preparer may prepare all or substantially all of a tax return or a claim for refund. The IRS will prescribe by forms, instructions, or other appropriate guidance the tax returns and claims for refund that a registered tax return preparer may prepare and sign. At this point, they're not limiting those forms. You pass the RTRP test and you can pretty much prepare any IRS form is what they're saying now. But I can see a future where they might say you can prepare individual series returns because that's the test that you passed. So I can see that in the future, they could be restricting the forms even though they're not doing it now. A registered tax return preparer may represent taxpayers before revenue agents, customer service representatives, or similar officers and employees of the IRS, including the Taxpayer Advocate Service, during an examination if the registered tax return preparer signed the tax return or claim for refund for the taxable year or period under examination. Well, this is not a new restriction. It's been a key difference between enrolled agents, CPAs, and attorneys, and unenrolled tax preparers for many, many years over a decade now, that a power of attorney can only be given to a person who is an EA attorney or CPA unless that person actually signed the return. So if you were an unenrolled tax preparer and you want to represent a client before the IRS on an audit of a tax return, but you didn't prepare or sign that return, you weren't allowed to do so. And that actually has not changed. It's the same rule in place. Unless otherwise prescribed by regulation or notice, this right does not permit such individuals to represent the taxpayer regardless of circumstances requiring representation before appeals office, revenue officers, counsel, or similar officers or employees of the IRS. So again, you might be able to represent a client in an audit, but if it moves past the audit, such as um, to an appeal, you're not maybe going to be able to do as much. A registered tax return preparer's authorization to practice also does not include the authority to provide tax advice to a client or another person except as necessary to prepare a tax return, claim for refund, or other document intended to be submitted to the IRS. Now, when I first read this, I thought, wow. And, and so, again, at that meeting in last November where David Williams was making a presentation, this subject came up, and I was not the one that needed to bring it up. There were plenty of other people in the room to bring it up for me. The subject of authority to practice or to provide tax advice restriction was a subject of concern expressed to David Williams by an Oregon licensed tax consultant at the November 2011 Tax Practitioner Forum in Portland, Oregon. You want to know uh, the exact place. It was at the NBC Suites Hotel at the airport about 300 people in the room, David Williams up in the front, and an LTC stands up and this is your question. Williams, who is the director of IRS's return preparer office, downplayed her concern in front of this entire room of people and stated that the IRS does not mean to prevent tax preparers from giving tax advice and that rather the intention is to prevent an RTRP from acting as an attorney by providing legal advice and not to prevent the RTRP from giving tax advice. However, my observation is that's not what this says. So he's downplaying the wording of this paragraph in front of a room full of uh, tax professionals, but his words are in contradiction to what I see the, the letters saying. <laughs> so what is it to give tax advice? And of course, here in Oregon, if you've passed that LTC exam, your word is that your title is tax consultant. Are you saying we can't consult um, anymore? 
And uh, so he was trying to downplay that. However, reading this very narrowly, I think that any person who is not an attorney, enrolled agent, or CPA should be very, very careful about when, if, and how they give tax advice. And perhaps if you're regularly doing tax consulting type work without preparing a tax return, I would recommend you pass that EA exam for protection. That's my opinion. Others. Any individual qualifying under paragraph section 10.5D or 10.7 is eligible to practice before the IRS to the extent provided for in those sections, and you can go read them for yourself. So who cannot practice before the IRS? Well, interestingly, the new Circular 230 doesn't tell you who's not allowed to practice. They only tell you who is allowed to practice. And that confused me because, you know, people like to say, well, when can't you do something? And you may have noticed that most IRS publications talk about when you can do something, when you can claim a dependent, when you pass all of the tests for being a particular filing status. They don't really very often go into descriptions of what doesn't qualify. They do do it sometimes. For example, IRS in Pub 17 says you cannot claim a deduction as an employee business expense for the cost of purchasing a wristwatch. That's something they go and give an example of what you can't do. But that's actually unusual. So when I was reading the new Circular 230 and it said uh, it did not provide information on who cannot practice, I went back to the old Circular 230 where it did state who could not practice. So I stuck that in here. So who cannot practice before the IRS? In general, individuals who are not eligible or who have lost the privilege as a result of certain actions cannot practice before the IRS. If an individual loses eligibility to practice, his or her power of attorney will not be recognized by the IRS. And the following uh, entities are not allowed to represent individuals. So essentially, you have to be the holder of a P10 to represent someone before the IRS. And a corporation association partnership is not an individual and cannot be issued a P10. So corporations, associations, and partnerships could not represent someone before the IRS. Also, government officers and employees and others, an individual who is an officer or employee of the executive, legislative, or judicial branch to the United States government, or an employee of, or an officer or an employee of the District of Columbia, a member of commerce, et cetera, may not practice before the IRS. And state officers, employees, no officer or employee of any state or subdivision of any state whose duties require him or her to pass upon, investigate, or deal with tax matters for such state or subdivision may practice before the IRS if such employment may disclose facts or information applicable to federal tax matters. So again, this is from the old version of Circular 230. It's not anywhere printed in the new one. But I thought you might find it interesting about who they used to say couldn't practice and you can kind of read through between the lines and assume that probably nothing's changed in that regard. Eligibility to become an enrolled agent, enrolled retirement plan agent, or a registered tax preparer. Firstly, we have enrollment as an enrolled agent upon examination. The commissioner or delegate will grant enrollment to an enrolled agent applicant who is 18 years of age or older, demonstrates special competence in tax matters by written examination administered by the IRS or one of its appointees, possess a current or otherwise valid prepared tax identification number, and is not engaged in any conduct that would justify suspension. It provides similar rules for who can enroll as a retirement plan agent. And then we move on to designation as a registered tax return preparer. The commissioner or delegate may designate an individual as a registered tax return preparer who is 18 years of age or older, demonstrates competence in federal tax return preparation matters by written examination, possesses a current or otherwise valid tax preparer identification number, and who has not engaged in any conduct that would justify suspension. Now there is also a paragraph in here about enrollment of former IRS service employees. It is possible to become an enrolled agent without passing the C, and it is possible to become an enrolled agent without passing the C if you were a former employee of the Internal Revenue Service. If that describes you, there's a whole series of rules that apply to such an individual. I'm not going to read them. Section 10.5, application to become an enrolled agent, enrolled retirement plan agent, or a registered tax return preparer. Um, firstly, there is a form. The applicant must apply as required by the form or procedures established and uh, send the form under, uh, form under oath or affirmation to the correct address. Also, the applicant must pay a reasonable fee. Additional information in the examination, the IRS may require the applicant to file additional information and to submit to a written or oral exam. Compliance and suitability checks, the IRS may conduct a federal tax compliance check and a suitability check. 
The tax compliance check verifies whether the applicant has filed all their tax returns and paid their debts. The suitability check verifies the applicant has not been engaged in incompetent or disreputable conduct that would result in disbarment. And if the applicant does not pass the tax compliance or suitability check, the applicant will not be issued an enrollment or a registration card. An applicant who is denied enrollment or registration for failure to pass a tax compliance check may reapply if the applicant becomes current with respect to the applicant's tax liabilities. I've noticed it doesn't provide instructions on what to do if uh, you've been incompetent or disreputable. It's only if you fail the tax compliance check that you can reapply. Um, temporary recognition. Temporary recognition may be granted in unusual circumstances. Protest of application denial. If an application is denied, you have 30 days to file a written protest. Section 10.6, term and renewal of status as an enrolled agent, enrolled retirement plan agent, or registered tax return preparer. Firstly, term. Each individual authorized to practice is subject to renewal as provided in this part. Enrollment or registry certificate. The IRS will issue an enrollment or registration card or certificate to individuals whose applications are approved. Each card or certificate will be valid for the period stated on the card or certificate. An individual may not practice before the IRS if the card or certificate is not current or otherwise valid, and the card or certificate is in addition to the required patent. Well, uh, one of the people who works for me in my office, she's not an enrolled agent. She is a licensed tax consultant. And yeah, she's talking about taking that EA test, but she was really interested in running out and taking the RTRP test. So she took it in December, and she had her little RTRP card sometime around April, I think, is when they started to issue those. She was sorely disappointed. It just didn't look that special. Just a half, it's like a, a sheet of paper like this. You just fold it in half, and it has her name, and it says registered tax return preparer, but it just didn't excite her too much. But I can tell you that the enrolled agent certificate that I have is very nice. It looks like a fancy diploma with gold foil on it and everything. Change of address. An individual must notify the IRS of a change of address within 60 days of the change. Renewal. In general, enrolled agents, enrolled retirement plan agents, and registered tax return preparers must renew their status to maintain eligibility to practice. Failure, and this is an interesting one, failure to receive notification from the IRS of the renewal requirement is not a justification for the individual's failure to satisfy this requirement. So what it's saying is, let's just suppose you moved. You're supposed to notify the IRS within 60 days of the fact that you moved and what your new address is, right? So you didn't do that. And you don't get, or even if you did do that, somehow you don't get the renewal application. And so you want an out clause that says, hey, I didn't get it. And the IRS says, sorry, you're required to renew, and your failure to renew because you didn't get a notice does not negate the fact that you were required to renew. So firstly, we're going to look at the renewal period for enrolled agents. Their renewal cycle is very, very different than that of the registered tax return preparer. All enrolled agents must renew their patents as prescribed by IRS. Status as an enrolled agent must be renewed every three years as determined by the last digit of the individual's tax identification number, usually your social security number. Applications for renewal of enrollment must be submitted between November 1 and January 31 prior to April 1st of the year of your next enrollment cycle. What? <laughs> what does that mean? OK. <laughs> well, let's look at this. If your TIN enters in a 0, 1, 2, or 3, your enrollment cycle begins April 1st, 2013. And your renewal cycle is between November 1, 2012 and January 31, 2013. So if you're one of these people currently with a social security number that ends in a 0, 1, 2, or 3, your period for renewing your EA is going to be uh, November 1st, 2012 until January 31st, 2013. And once you renew, you'll be valid for the next enrollment cycle that begins April 1st, 2013. Does that make sense? If not, just study it a little farther. And of course, if your Social Security number ends in a 4, 5, or 6, your, renew uh, your enrollment cycle begins April 1st, and renewal will be, will be next year. November of 2013. And if your social security number ends in a 7, 8, or 9, your enrollment cycle already began for 2012. And uh, your opportunity to renew is in the past. Um, is the enrolled agent, it is the enrolled agent's responsibility to apply for renewal by timely filing form 8554, which was revised in February of 2011 and paying the $30 
annual renewal fee, or not, not annual renewal fee, but cyclical renewal <laughs> fee. Once every three years, an enrolled agent needs to renew and pay 30 bucks. And it used to be a lot more than that. But because we now also have to have a PTIN every single year, um, some of the costs have been transferred over into that PTIN program. Renewal for a period for enrolled retirement plan agents, these individuals have to renew every three years. If you are one of those rare individuals, I'll leave you to read that on your own. Renewal period for registered tax return preparers, RTRPs must renew their PTINs annually as prescribed by the IRS. And quite frankly, even if you aren't an RTRP, you still have to renew your PTIN annually. So uh, there's not much difference in terms of the PTIN renewal. Everybody has to renew. They need to renew every year between essentially October 15 and the end of the year. But the additional burden on registered tax return preparers is that they need to present evidence of completion of 15 hours of CPE, whereas other categories will not need to submit that evidence. Um, and actually, the, I'll explain a little bit later that the registered tax return preparer does not even submit evidence, that the evidence is submitted by the school and not the preparer directly. Notification of renewal. After approval, the IRS will issue the individual a card or certificate showing current status as an enrolled agent, enrolled retirement plan agent, or registered tax return preparer. Next item is condition for renewal, including continuing education. Many of the questions I get from enrolled agents and tax preparers who are required to sit the RTRP test have to do with continuing education. When is it qualifying? When is it not? It's an area that causes quite a bit of confusion, so we're obviously covering it here for that reason, but we're also covering it because all of the instructions regarding continued educa continue education are included in Circular 230. So in order to qualify for renewal as an EA uh, or RTRP, an individual must complete the requisite number of continuing education hours. If you are an enrolled agent, Renewal of enrollment requires a minimum of 72 hours of continuing education credit, including six hours of ethics or professional conduct that must be completed during each enrollment cycle, and a minimum of 16 hours of continuing education credit, including two hours of ethics or professional conduct, must be completed during each enrollment year of an enrollment cycle. So an EA has to take at least 16 hours a year but if you take 16 and multiply it by 3, you get less than 72. So 16 is just the minimum number of hours in a year. And by the time you have finished three years, you have to meet 16 hours per year, plus two hours per year, or including two hours a year of ethics. And over a three-year period, you have to do some years more than 16 hours to get up to 72. An individual who receives initial enrollment during an enrollment cycle must complete two hours of qualifying continuing education for each month enrolled during the enrollment cycle, but enrollment for any part of a month is considered enrollment for the entire month. Two hours of ethics education must be completed every year, including the first year. Registered tax return preparer renewal is a little bit more specific. Renewal of registration requires a minimum of 15 hours of CPE each year, including two hours of ethics or professional conduct, three hours of federal tax law update, and 10 hours of federal tax law topic. The IRS has announced that it will allow for a proration of CPE hours for those preparers who register partway through their first year. So I can see that, wow, gosh, we're at 10 minutes past the hour, probably due for another break, 12 minutes past the hour specifically. So let's take a um, 10 minute break. So let's get on with the topic again which is qualifying continuing education requirements. Depending on who you are, the CPE requirements do differ, not just in the number of hours, um, but also for other reasons. If you are an enrolled agent, the CPE must be from a program that is designed to enhance professional knowledge in federal taxation or federal tax-related matters, including accounting, tax return preparation, software, taxation, or ethics, and be a qualifying continuing education program. So we're going to get into what is a qualifying education program in just a bit. But the first rule for enrolled agents is that really you have to be taking a program on federal tax law. In other words, uh, studying California law would not give you federal CPE. There is a little bit of a, an exception to that. If you're describing how state law and federal law are different, then you would be indirectly talking about federal law and they allow it. But in general, the, law, the tax law studied has to be federal law. 
For enrolled retirement plan agents, the CPE must be about qualified retirement plan matters, as well as being from a qualifying continuing education program. And for registered tax return preparers, the CPE must be a qualifying continuing education program that is designed to enhance professional knowledge in federal taxation or federal tax related matters, including accounting, tax return preparation, software, taxation, or ethics, and again, be a qualifying continuing education program. So what is a qualifying program? Well, qualifying program is a formal program, and a formal program qualifies as continuing education if it requires attendance and provides each attendee with a certificate of attendance, is conducted by a qualified instructor, discussion leader, or speaker whose background, training, education, and experience is appropriate for the subject matter of the particular program, provides or requires a written outline, textbook, or suitable electronic educational materials, and satisfies the requirements established for a qualified continuing education program. So for those of you who are in our classroom, our education program has met the requirement by giving you a printout of the manual. And those of you who are attending via the webinar, webcast, self-paced online programs, uh, the manual is provided for you to um, download and print, or download and not print, whichever you prefer. Also, the program provides or requires a written outline, textbook, or suitable electronic educational materials, satisfies the requirements established for a continuing education program pursuant to Section 10.9. The next topic is correspondence or individual study programs. Qualifying continuing education programs include correspondence or individual study programs that meet the following conditions. So it's pretty common for individuals to get CPE in two different ways. One is to come to a classroom, or a comparison is to attend a webinar or webcast where you're a student sitting there listening to a live presentation. The other is I can't make that particular date, or I can't drive to that particular location. Can I just do it on my own time as self-study or correspondence? And the answer is the IRS does provide an allowance for self-study correspondence materials and courses, provided they meet the following conditions. Number one, they are conducted by a continuing education provider and completed on an individual basis by the enrolled individual. In other words, you can't have someone else do your, own, your CPE for you. The allowable credit hours for such programs will be measured on a basis comparable to the measurement of a seminar or course for credit in an accredited educational institution. They require registration of the participants by the continuing education provider provide a means for measuring successful completion by the participants, for example, a written examination, including the issuance of a certificate of completion by the continuing education provider. They provide a written outline, textbook, or other suitable electronic educational materials, and they satisfy the requirements established for a continuing education program pursuant to Section 10.9. And we'll get to Section 10.9 as we're going. Serving as a, an instructor, discussion leaker, uh, leader, or speaker, can I get CPE for providing CPE? Can I get it as being your instructor? Um, the answer is yes, just a little bit, not all of it. I'm not allowed to get all my CPE from me, and neither is any other instructor. So one hour of continuing education credit will be awarded for each contact hour completed as an instructor, discussion leader, or speaker at an educational program that meets the CPE requirements. A maximum of two hours of CPE credit will be awarded for actual subject preparation time for each contact hour completed as an instructor, discussion leader, or speaker at such programs. But it is the responsibility of the individual who claims such credit to maintain records to verify preparation time. The maximum continuing education credit for instruction and preparation may not exceed four hours annually for the registered tax return preparer or six hours annually for the enrolled agent. So that's rather interesting. So if you are teaching full time, no matter what, you're still going to have to show that the majority of the required hours came from someone other than yourself. So uh, people who are in the profession of teaching tax law uh, don't get credit for most of what they do and still have to show that most of their credit is coming from an external source. An instructor, discussion leader, or speaker who makes more than one presentation of the same subject matter during an enrollment cycle or registration year will receive continuing education credit for only one such presentation for the enrollment cycle or uh, registration year. Periodic examination, enrolled agents and enrolled retirement plan agents may establish eligibility for renewal for any enrollment cycle by achieving a passing score on each part of the special enrollment examination and 
completing a minimum of 16 hours of qualifying CPE during the last year of the enrollment cycle. So this is basically now, if you're an enrolled agent and you, you really don't have 72 hours, but you can muster 16 hours for the final year of enroll enrollment, and it's not even possible to get 16 hours for the two earlier years because, well, you just didn't get it done, right? <laughs> you can sidestep that issue by resitting the C. You can go retake the C exam, and that will be a substitute for some, but not all, of the CPE requirements. Measurement of continuing education coursework. All continuing education programs will be measured in terms of contact hours. The shortest recognized program will be one contact hour. A contact hour is 50 minutes of continuous participation in a program. Credit is granted only for a full contact hour, which is 50 minutes or multiples thereof. So a program lasting more than 50 minutes but less than 100 minutes will count as only one contact hour. Individual segments at continuous conferences, conventions, and the like will be considered one total program. For example, if you attend two 90-minute segments totaling 180 minutes, you will be given three contact hours. And for university or college courses, each semester hour credit will equal 15 contact hours and a quarter hour credit will equal 10 contact hours. Password number two is Dwarf, D-W-A-R-F, Dwarf. Record keeping requirements. For CPE programs completed, the following information must be retained for a period of four years following the date of renewal. The name of the sponsoring organization, the location of the program, the title of the program, qualified program number, and a description of its content. Written outlines, course syllabi, textbook, and or electronic materials provided or written are required for the course. The dates attended, the credit hours claimed, the name or names of the instructors, discussion leaders, or speakers, if appropriate, and the certificate of completion or signed statement of the hours of attendance obtained from the CPE provider. For services completed as an instructor, discussion leader, or speaker, the following information must be maintained for a period of four years following the date of the renewal. That is the name of the sponsoring organization, the location of the program, the title of the program, and a copy of its content the dates of the program, and the credit hours claimed. Waivers. Waivers from the CPE requirements may be granted for the following reasons. Health, which prevented compliance with the CPE requirements. Extended active military duty. Absence from the United States for an extended period of time due to employment or other reasons, provided the individual does not practice before the IRS during such absence, and other compelling reasons which will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. You should refer to public, uh, Circular 230, page 16, for restrictions and information on how to apply for a waiver. Failure to comply. Individuals who fail to meet the CPE and fee requirements for renewal will receive a letter of noncompliance and will be given opportunity to furnish the requested information in writing within 60 days of the notice. If renewal is denied, an individual may file written protest within 30 days after receipt of the notice of denial of renewal. CPE records may be reviewed to determine compliance with IRS requirements. Individuals may be required to provide copies of CPE records, and failure to supply these records can cause the CPE hours to be disallowed. So essentially, IRS is saying if you are a registered tax return preparer or a person who is required to take the RTRP test, the school needs to be uploading the hours and only an approved school will be able to upload your hours. But in addition to that, you're still required to maintain your certificate, just in case they ask for it. And if you are an enrolled agent or an enrolled retirement plan agent, then you have to, have to keep those CPE records in case they are asked for. An individual who fails to file a timely renewal and does not make a timely response to the notice of noncompliance will be placed on a roster of inactive individuals and is not eligible to practice before the IRS. Individuals placed on an active or ineligible status may not state or imply that they are eligible to practice before the IRS. An individual placed on an active status may be reinstated to active status by filing application for renewal and providing evidence of completion of all required CPE. 
Application for renewal and required CPE must be submitted within three years of being placed on inactive status. Inactive status, however, is not available to individuals who are subject of a pending disciplinary matter before the IRS. So uh, if you, you're worried about uh, having your right to practice before the IRS re revoked because you have been naughty, um, a way out of this problem is not to put yourself on an inactive status. You're not eligible for that status. In active retirement status, an individual who, is no who no longer practices before the IRS may request to be placed on inactive and retirement status. The individual will be, will be ineligible to practice before the IRS. The status may be reinstated to active status by filing an application for renewal and completion of the required CPE hours. Inactive retirement status is also not available to an individual who is ineligible to practice before the IRS or is the subject of a pending disciplinary matter. Renewal while well under suspension or disbarment. An individual who is ineligible to practice before the IRS by virtue of disciplinary action is required to conform to the requirements for renewal or of enrollment or registration before that uh, individual's eligibility is restored. And in answer to the question, Sandy Tharp has said earlier, it was like, how do I check to see if I've got my CPE hours? Sandy Tharp says, I just logged into my account with IRS. At this time, no CPE completed has been listed and will not show until October 15, 2012. So the answer is, after October 15, 2012, um, it might be possible to see something because right now you can't renew anyway. <laughs> so it appears when you go to renew, you're going to be told what you have and whether it's enough. And if you don't have enough, then you're going to have to go get more. Um, Sandy Tharp, uh, who is one of the persons on our staff here, she's actually one of our instructors, um, she's just logged in to see her PTIN renewal process to see whether any CPE is loaded in there for her. And she can't see anything because it's just too early. The system isn't showing it yet. So there's lots of information here about what's supposed to be happening. And of course, there's a lot of concern coming from people that can't see what's happening because the system just isn't fully operating yet. And we're really a month away from where it needs to be fully operational. And given IRS's practice over the last couple of years, they do wait until the very last minute to get everything up and running. Section 10.7, representing oneself, participating in rulemaking, limited practice, and special appearances. Firstly, representing oneself. Individuals may appear on their own behalf before the IRS, provided they present satisfactory identification. So you can present yourself before the IRS and represent yourself. That's nice to know. Participating in rulemaking. Individuals may participate in rulemaking as provided by the Administrative Procedure Act. Limited practice. An individual who is not a practitioner may represent a taxpayer before the IRS in the following circumstances, provide the individual presents satisfactory identification and proof of his or her authority to represent the taxpayer. Firstly, an individual may represent a member of his or her immediate family. A regular full-time employee of an individual employer may represent the employer. A general partner or a regular full-time employee of a partnership may represent the partnership. A bona fide officer or a regular full-time employee of a corporation may represent the corporation. A regular full-time employee of a trust, receivership, or guardianship may represent that entity. An officer or a regular employee of a governmental unit, agency, or authority may represent the government. An individual may represent an individual or entity who is outside of the United States before personnel of the IRS when such representation takes place outside of the United States. Limitations under Section 10.7. An individual who is under suspension or disbarment from practice before the IRS may not engage in limited practice before the IRS. Other limitations also apply. And if you think that covers you, refer to page 16 of Circular 230 for more information. Next up is section 10.8, return preparation and application of rules to other individuals, preparing all or substantially all of a tax return. Any individual who, for compensation, prepares or assists in the preparation of all or substantially all of a tax return or a claim for refund must have a PTIN. Except as otherwise prescribed in forms, instructions, or other appropriate guidance, the individual must be an attorney, CPA, EA, or an RTRP to be able to have a PTIN. Preparing a tax return and furnishing information. Any individual may, for compensation, prepare, assist, 
with the preparation, prepare or assist with the preparation of a tax return or a claim for refund, provided the individual prepares less than substantially all of the tax return or claim for refund. So apparently what this paragraph is saying, let's suppose someone comes in off the street and says to an individual, could you please help me prepare this Schedule C? IRS seems to be saying, yeah, you could actually help someone prepare a Schedule C as long as you're not preparing all or substantially all of the tax return. And you could do so without um, passing the test or otherwise meeting requirements. But again, the number of forms that you're allowed to prepare without a P-10 does not include a Schedule C. So I would take it to mean that you are able to prepare a Schedule C or assist someone in the preparation of a Schedule C for their tax return for compensation, but you would still need to have a P-10. But you wouldn't have to pass the RTRP test or be an enrolled agent or a CPA um, if you're not actually signing the return or you're preparing less than all of the return. That's kind of what I'm reading into this paragraph. But it's really not terribly clear, and quite frankly, from my position, when I have someone coming off the street into my tax office who wants me to prepare only a single form for them, I'm not interested. Uh, I've got an all or nothing attitude towards tax returns. I either do the entire return or I do none of the return. But it does appear that the IRS does allow that to go on. Um, an individual may, for compensation, appear as a witness for taxpayers before the IRS or furnish information at the request of the IRS or any of its officers or employees. Application of rules to other individuals. Any individual who, for compensation, prepares or assists in the preparation of all or substantial portion of a document pertaining to any taxpayer liability for submission to the IRS is subject to the duties and restrictions related to practice in subpart B, the sections for violation of regulations in subpart C, and unless otherwise a practitioner, however, an individual may not for compensation prepare or assist in the preparation of all or substantially all of a tax return or a claim for refund or sign tax returns or claims for refund. So that, again, this is a lot of legalese that I think pretty much comes back to that illustration I just gave. You could help someone with preparation of the return. You could even be paid for it. But anything you do in that regard would still be considered practice before the IRS, and you could still be penalized for acting inappropriately or in violation of the regulations. In 10.9, continuing education providers and CPE programs. I've said several times we're going to come to this point, and here we are. Uh, firstly, continuing education providers in general. A continuing education provider is those responsible for presenting continuing education programs. A continuing education provider must be one of the following. An accredited educational institution, recognized for continuing education purposes by the licensing body of any state, territory, or possession of the United States, including a Commonwealth or the District of Columbia. Recognized and approved by a qualifying organization as a provider of CPE on subject matters within Section 10.8F of this part or be recognized by the IRS as a professional organization, society, or business whose programs include offering continuing professional education opportunities in subject matters. So essentially what IRS is saying is if you're an RTRP or an enrolled agent, you need to get your CPE from an approved provider. And in order to get approval, the provider has to be an accredited, edu accredited educational institution, such as a college or university. Or they have to be recognized um, for continuing education purposes by the licensing body of any state. For example, within the state of California, CTEC, the California Tax Education Council, um, re reviews applications and approves CPE uh, providers. And so if you are approved through CTEC, then you are eligible to apply for approval from the IRS. But you couldn't just decide to get approval from the IRS without having something else first. Um, and that first being either you're an edu accredited educational institution, you're recognized by the licensing body of any state as a provider of CPE, or you're recognized and approved by a qualifying organization as a provider of continuing education. And an example of such an organization is NASBA, the National Association of the State Boards of Accountancy. So if you're approved by NASBA, then you're eligible to be approved by IRS. And finally, if you have been recognized by the IRS as a professional organization, society, or business, whose programs include offering CPE education opportunities in the subject matter. Now, to give you an example, the one thing our school is not is an accredited educational institution, that is Pacific Northwest Tax School.
we are actually licensed through the Oregon Department of Education to offer um, education programs in tax law, um, but that's different than being an accredited or an institution. However, we are uh, recognized through CTAC, we are recognized through NASBA, and we are also recognized directly through the IRS. So of the four categories, our particular school has three of them. And uh, any educational provider you go to is going to have to meet one of these four categories plus register with the IRS. The IRS uh, may, at its discretion, identify a professional organization, society, or business entity that maintains minimum education standards comparable to those set forth in this part as a qualifying organization. So what that's saying is you may not have CTEC, you may not have NASBA, but maybe you can show something else that's the equivalent, and we're willing to accept that. Uh, that would, of course, involve quite a bit of work. Continuing education providers who wish to register with the IRS must do so by applying online using the IRS Continuing Education Provider System, which is administered by Kinsale. This is the link. You can click on it. A non-refundable application of $419 must be paid, and providers must renew and pay that $419 fee annually. Currently, the only IRS-approved accrediting organization is the National Association of the State Boards of Accountancy, which is NASBA. So NASBA is quite a bit of work. If you've gone through the application process for NASBA, it's not easy. It's a lot of work. I can attest to that. CTEC is a lot of work as well. Um, so really, it's quite a hurdle to become an approved CPE provider for IRS because you first have to jump through other hurdles. Continuing education provider numbers. A continuing education provider is required to obtain a continuing education provider number and pay the applicable user fee. A continuing education provider must maintain, must maintain its status by filing renewal forms and paying the fee as prescribed by IRS. A continuing education provider must ensure that the qualified continuing education program uh, complies with all of the following requirements. Firstly, the programs must be developed by individuals who are qualified in the subject matter. The program's subject matter must be current. Instructors, discussion leaders, and speakers must be qualified with respect to the content. Programs must include some means for evaluation of the technical content and presentation to be evaluated. Certificates of completion bearing a current qualified continuing education program number issued by the IRS must be provided to the participants who successfully complete the program. This is an interesting paragraph because essentially what goes on in the world of CPE providers, and we're smack in the middle of it uh, with Pacific Northwest Tax School, is that you've got CPAs who are regulated by their individual state boards of accountancy. You have enrolled agents and registered tax return preparers who are regulated by the IRS. And in Oregon, you also have tax preparers who are regulated by the Oregon Board of Tax Practitioners. And in California, you have tax preparers who are regulated by CTEC. Each and every one of the organizations I mentioned has their own standards. And none of them are in compliance with the others. And so for example, NASBA requires that the NASBA number be on every certificate of completion. CTEC requires that the CTEC registration number be on there, as well as the course number for every course. The IRS requires that the IRS-issued number and the IRS-issued course number for every course be listed on the notice. And certain state boards of accountancy, like the Texas State Board of Public Accountancy and the New York State Board of Public Accountancy, also require their numbers be present on the certificate. So it's an overwhelmingly large number of requirements that are imposed on an education provider, and an education provider has to comply with all of those. So when you print out or see a copy of Pacific Northwest Tax School Certificate of Completion, you will see it's just filled with numbers and all of these things. And it's because if you are a CPA uh, working in a state that requires NASBA approval, that NASBA number needs to be on the certificate. If you are a preparer in the state of California, the CTEC number and the CTEC code has to be on that certificate. And if you're a person who is obtaining a CPE for IRS renewal, that number issued by IRS has to be on there. And none of the numbers are the same. There is no uniform standard. Also, records must be maintained by the continuing education pro provider to verify the participants who attended and completed the program for a period of four years after following completion of the program. 
in the case of continuous conferences, conventions, and the like, records must be maintained to verify completion of the program and attendance by each participant at each segment of the program. All right, a message from the IRS to education providers. On April 2nd of 2012, the IRS sent our school, and I'm sure they sent every other school, um, this notice regarding certificates of completion. The IRS said, please share the information below with your customers. That is, those of you who are in attendance of today's class. Recently, the IRS has received a number of certificates of completion directly from tax preparers. Please assist us in communicating to preparers attending your programs that they do not need to submit these certificates to the IRS because you, the provider, are responsible for doing so. So what that means is you have to uh, attend your CPE through a qualified approved provider, and it is that provider's responsibility to notify the IRS that you completed the program. And please do not send your certificates to IRS, obviously, unless they request them. Program numbers, I've kind of been mentioning that every course has to have a program number. This is the IRS's rule, not ours. Uh, and IRS issues the program numbers, we do not. CTEC issues the numbers, we do not. And naturally, they are not the same numbers. So one program can have multiple numbers, and that's just the way it is. Generally, every continuing education provider is required to obtain a continuing education provider number and pay an applicable user fee. Program numbers shall be obtained as prescribed by the forms, instructions, and other appropriate guidance. And the IRS may require a continuing education provider to demonstrate that the program meets IRS requirements. Update programs. This is very interesting because I think of an update program as uh, a course that you take and where you learn about changes in the tax law. I think of that as an update program. But that's not how IRS defines it. Let's see how IRS defines update program. Update programs may use the same number as the program subject to the update. An update program is a program that instructs on a change of existing law occurring with one year of the update program offering. The qualifying education program subject to the update must have been offered within the two-year time period prior to the change in existing law. So all that's saying is if I teach you current law, it is an update. So again, I think of an update program as here's everything that's changed. Um, this is what's coming up for the coming tax season, changes in forms, new things that you need to be aware of. But IRS is much broader in its definition. It's saying if you take a program and that program has been updated to be current with law, it can be called an update program, or parts of it could be referred to as an update program. Change in existing law. A change in existing law means the effective date of the statute or regulation or date of entry of judicial system, uh, decision that is the subject of the update and failure to comply, the IRS will notify a continuing education provider who fails to meet compliance requirements and will provide the CPE provider with an opportunity to furnish the requested information in writing. Subpart B, duties and restrictions relating to practice before the IRS. Firstly, beginning with information to be furnished to the IRS. Practitioners must promptly submit records or information requested by officers or employees of the IRS. A practitioner can be exempted from this, these rules if he or she believes in good faith and on reasonable grounds that the information requested is privileged or that the request is of doubtful legality. The IRS has taken the position that nothing is confidential that was used in the preparation of the tax return. Because the tax return is being submitted, it is by nature, in terms of IRS, not protected. And therefore, if you used information to prepare the tax return and the IRS then asks you for that information, you're going to have to turn it over. Tax practitioner is not in possession of records. So you used information to prepare the tax return, but now you don't have those records. Well, if you're like me, the last thing I want is a drawer full of records belonging to all of my clients. And I make a, an extremely regular habit of returning them all. There are some practitioners out there who religiously photocopy every single document that's ever brought or scan every single document that's ever brought into them. There's no legal requirement to do so. Um, and so it would be a fairly common thing for the tax practitioner to not be in possession of the records. So where the IRS requests records from a practitioner and the practitioner does not have possession of the records, the practitioner must promptly notify the requesting Internal Revenue Office uh, person or employee that they don't have them and provide any information that he or she has regarding the identity of any person the practitioner believes might have possession of the records and make reasonable inquiry of his or her client regarding the identity of the person who has possession or control of the requested records. 
the practitioner is not required to make inquiry of any other person or to independently verify information provided by the practitioner's client regarding the identity of such persons. So IRS comes along and is doing an audit on your client. And uh, you get a request from the IRS to provide whatever documentation you have regarding the audit. And the IRS might specifically state, we want copies of the P&L you use to prepare the tax return. Well, odds are you should have kept a copy of the P&L. I know I would. But maybe I didn't keep a copy of the entire ledger backing it up or the QuickBooks backup. Maybe I don't have that. Um, but I should know where I originally got that information as best as I can recollect. And I need to be able to tell the IRS where I think that information is and how to get that information. Do I remember that there was an independent bookkeeper who was assisting my client and I got the information from that bookkeeper? If so, provide that information. If I believe my client is in possession of the records, provide the IRS with that information regarding my client and how to get hold of my client. And by now, my client should know that they're under audit anyway. So there's that side. Interference with lawful requests for records. A practitioner may not interfere with any proper and lawful effort of the IRS or its employees to obtain any record or information unless the practitioner believes in good faith and on reasonable grounds that the record or information is privileged. Knowledge of client's omission. A practitioner who is retained by a client to assist or represent that client with respect to a matter administered by the IRS must promptly inform the client of any errors or omissions the practitioner finds with regard to the preparation of any return or document that has been submitted to the IRS. The practitioner must also advise the client of the consequences or errors, omissions, or noncompliance with provisions under the code. So someone, a client has come in, and uh, they want you to prepare this year's tax return. And the ordinary action I would take, and most preparers should take, would be to ask to see a copy of last year's tax return could be that the tax return was prepared by you last year and you're just reviewing your own work. Um, or it could be that that tax return was prepared by another person within your firm. Or it could be that the tax return was prepared by the client. Or it could be that the tax return was prepared by another professional outside of your firm. And while you're reviewing that return, you notice that there is a mistake. Should you ignore the mistake? Should you notify the client of the mistake? Well, IRS says you need to notify the client of the mistake. And here's the hard part. If it's your mistake, you're now catching your own mistake and telling your client, hey, I made a mistake. Are you required to tell your client that you made a mistake? The IRS is saying, yes, you do need to tell your client that you made a mistake, embarrassing as it is. And the client may be rather upset that you made a mistake. Or it could be you've noticed a mistake from another person in your firm, and now you're saying, hey, uh, So-and-so in the office next door, oh my gosh, he missed this. That's not good. So uh, now it makes your firm look like it didn't do a good job. And that's the hard part about ethics. One of the harder things about ethics is that the IRS requires you look for errors you see notify of them. And it may not be an easy thing to do when the brunt of the anger is going to come right back on you. And if you say nothing, maybe no one will ever notice. <laughs> and so there is that temptation to say nothing in hopes that it will never come up. But the reality is you are required to notify the client. You're also required to tell the client what that error or omission means to them. Did they get too small a refund? Did they get too much of a refund? What are the penalties for failure to deal with that error? They need to file an amended return. What happens if they don't? Section 10.22, diligence as to accuracy. A practitioner must exercise due diligence when performing the following duties. Preparing or assisting in preparing, approving, and filing returns, documents, affidavits, and other papers related to IRS matters. Determining the correctness of oral or written representations made by him or her to the Department of the Treasury. And determining the correctness of oral or written representations made by the practitioner to clients with, with reference to any matter administered by the IRS. Now I have some notes in here from other documents I've read over time from IRS and other sources. One of these is that it is considered due diligence for the practitioner to rely on the work product of another person if the practitioner has used reasonable care in engaging, supervising, training, and evaluating the person. So what would be a standard or a measurement of reasonable care? 
are you engaging in reasonable care if you've hired someone who has passed the RTRP exam? They've passed that exam. They have a registered tax return preparer card. You've hired them. Is that enough? Or do you need to do more than that? IRS says you need to have systems in place to ensure that some level of accuracy is obtained, but they don't really define what those are. So again, this is where ethics is a little bit open to self-evaluation, I suppose, or opinion. However, the bottom line is, I can just tell you from my perspective as an employer, I consider due diligence on my part of as an employer to mean that I know what my preparers know and don't know, that I'm training them, that I'm reviewing their work, um, that when I find a mistake in their work, I notify them of it, I retrain them on the issue. Sometimes the mistake is because they were just busy and missed it. Sometimes the mistake is because they had no clue what they were doing. Sometimes the mistake is because they did data entry and didn't double check their work. Um, but it's my job as the supervisor to ensure that minimum standards are in place. How far you're willing to go into that in any firm uh, is going to be dictated by the resources you have available and how important you even think it is to do those things. And IRS, without defining, providing more guidance, is really leaving it that open to us. So how do you determine what reasonable care is? Well, that's going to be your decision. I'm very, very strict on what I consider reasonable care to be. Therefore, you could say I'm rather difficult to work for. <laughs> Lots of people have found it not easy to work for me. Here is an example. Staff working under the supervision of a CPA or an enrolled agent. It is common for CPAs, EAs, and an unenrolled tax preparers to employ tax preparers on staff who are responsible for collecting and entering tax return information onto a tax return. IRS requires a practitioner to exercise due diligence by ensuring that reasonable care is used in hiring and training these employees. The IRS sometimes, however, issues more detailed regulations and guidance for specific tax preparation situations. And in particular is this example involving the earned income credit. Um, the earned income credit is very much a focal point of the IRS for, for audits. They look at the returns themselves frequently, and then they also look at the tax preparers who are preparing those returns. I know that the IRS was sending out letters regarding Schedule E and Schedule C. It's also been sending out letters to tax practitioners regarding the earned income credit. Those letters are being sent out when statistically your P10 has above average error rates in audits. Now, is the error rate your fault? Or is it that you are in an area that is a target for fraud? So for example, if you are in a tax office that does one earned income credit tax return every three years, it's unlikely you're going to get a letter regarding problems with earned income credit, even if the only EIC return you did was completely bad. <laughs> you had a 100% error rate, right? but you only did one. You're probably not going to get that letter, because there's not a pattern there. Um, and conversely, if you are in an office that got a letter regarding Schedule E, the IRS is saying, hey, we looked at these returns that you did that had Schedule E attached, and we didn't really like them very much. <laughs> you need to really evaluate how you're preparing these tax returns and educate yourself on the rules and regulations uh, surrounding preparation of Schedule E, and also have conversations with your clients about the types of things they may or may not be allowed to deduct and that they have records to support those things. So uh, IRS refers to those as soft letters. A soft letter comes when they're looking at you. It's your chance to clean up your act. Um, and it could be you got a soft letter for no justification. You could have been doing everything exactly in compliance, and it's just your bad luck that the statistics worked against you. Um, and one of these where I could easily see that happen would be with regards to the earned income credit. The IRS says that this is due diligence, and you could do all of these things and still get a soft letter. But let's see what they are. Firstly, the soft letter comes to the tax preparer, whose PTIN is on the return that had a, an above average rate of inaccuracy in audits for that particular category of form. So uh, IRS says, with regards to the earned income credit, you, have, you are exercising due diligence if you meet all four of these categories. 
Firstly, completion of the eligibility checklist. And of course, now it's not just a checklist, it's a form, 8867, that has to be submitted with the return. And you must complete that checklist based on information provided by the taxpayer to the tax preparer. In other words, you can't prepare the earned income credit checklist without interviewing the client and having the client answer the questions on it. So you should not be awarding EIC without interviewing the client and establishing entitlement. Computation of the credit, you have to keep the EIC worksheet or an equivalent that demonstrates how you computed EIC. Next, we have the knowledge factor. You must not know or have reason to know that any information used in determining the taxpayer's eligibility for or the amount of the EIC is incorrect. You must not ignore the implications of information furnished or known. You must make reasonable inquiries if the information furnished or known appears to be incorrect, inconsistent, or incomplete. Well, this knowledge thing is given in an example relating to the earned income credit, but there's absolutely no reason to expect that this same knowledge test would not apply to any other tax form or deduction you might ever complete. Finally, record retention. Uh, regarding earned income credit, you must run the seven and the EIC worksheet or its equivalent. You must maintain a record of how and when the information used to complete these forms was obtained. You must verify the identity of the person who furnished you the information. And you must maintain the record for three years after June 30th, following the date the return or claim for it was presented for signature. So um, I think we need to have one last break, because we've only had two today, right? Yeah, so the rules say I need to give you at least, well, I don't have to give you one per hour, and I never do but I will give you at least three in a four-hour class. How's that? So let's take 10 minutes. OK, everyone, back from break. There's one question here. Terry Christman says, April, I employ a part-time compensated individual who aids in the preparation of the return but does not find the return. Does such an individual have to be registered? Well, the question is, Terry, is this a non-signing preparer who is working for a firm or a business that is 80% or more owned by a CPA, EA, or attorney? And does a supervising CPA, EA, or attorney sign the return? If you can't answer yes to both those questions, then no, you would not be allowed to employ that individual unless they are registered, or at this point have a PTIN. And until December 31, 2013, they're issued provisional PTINs because they can work as preparers without passing the competency test up until the end of next year. And then I have Kathy Gilliam who asks, if the client did not pay you as a paid preparer of both personal and corporate returns, is there anything regarding notifying the service that you were not a paid preparer? Further, uh, you have found some of the information received may result in underreporting of income or overreporting of expenses. Essentially what I take this to mean is someone came in, you interviewed them, you might have helped them with the return in some way, but you didn't sign the return. Um, is there any way to tell the IRS you didn't sign the return? Well, they can see you didn't sign the return because your signature is not on it. <laughs> but can you report what you think is fraud? There is uh, an actual form that you can use to report fraud. Um, in the past, I've tried to call IRS and say, you know, I think you should take a look at this individual. And uh, the IRS has said, well, you need to fill out form XYZ. I can't remember what it's called. Well, I don't really care for that idea. I'd just as soon be able to report the individual. Over a decade ago, probably 15 years ago, there was a uh, scam ring that was coming through my offices. It was easy to identify it as being a scam ring. And I tried to report it to the IRS, and they didn't want to hear about it. They weren't interested in it. Um, they didn't offer me to fill out a form either, but even if they had offered me to fill out a form, I wasn't sure I wanted to submit a form that could be evidence in court held or you know, by people who were criminals. I don't really want those criminals to know that maybe I reported them. I would just as soon be able to you know, drop a little hint somewhere. So this troubled me greatly, because it was obviously a scam ring. It had a ringleader, and it was going on, and it was happening in my offices. And I wanted to report it and put a stop to it without those individuals knowing I had done it. And I was not having much success. So finally, I called a person I know at IRS uh, here in Portland, Oregon. And I said, do I need to take this to the media or something? Or do you think you can get to what I am orally telling them? And before you knew it, I had uh, investigators in my office from IRS collecting all the evidence. And the ring was shut down. So how far you're willing to go, uh, that's up to you. But I don't like it when I see it. And I do what I can. 
but not by filling out that form. Okay, uh, moving on, 10.23, prompt disposition of pending matters. You can't delay the prompt disposition of matters before the IRS. Of course, IRS doesn't always make it easy to be prompt, particularly when they in, uh, initiate an audit in the middle of tax season and somehow expect you're supposed to drop everything you're doing uh, to assist your client with an audit. And pretty much I most voicefully complain about these, but IRS does conduct audits in tax season, and you are expected to provide some assistance for an audit in the tax season. And you, although you can use that as an excuse, you still have to work diligently and promptly. Assistance from or to disbarred or suspended persons. You cannot accept assistance from a disbarred person, nor may you uh, provide assistance if you are disbarred. Practice by former government employees, their partners and associates. Former government employees and their partners are subject to additional rules. If this means you, you need to read section 10.25. Notaries. A practitioner may not act as a notary or certify papers with respect to any matter in which the practitioner is interested. Um, and fees. This is an interesting one. In general, a practitioner may not charge an unconscionable fee in connection with any matter before the IRS. Contingent fees. A preparer may not charge a contingent fee for services rendered with any matter before the IRS except where the contingency fee relates to an IRS examination of or challenge to an original tax return or an amended return filed within 120 days of IRS notification to the taxpayer of the examination or challenge of the original return. The contingency fee is for services in, in connection with a claim for refund or refund solely in connection with the statutory interest or penalties assessed by the IRS, or the contingency fee is in connection with a judicial proceeding. So in general, IRS is saying you need to have a fee schedule, and it needs to make sense. And if your fee schedule in any way is contingent upon the outcome of a tax return, that's illegal. So what is a contingency fee? Contingency fee is a fee that is based upon a percentage of the refund reported on a tax return, or a percentage of the taxes saved, or otherwise depends on the specific results attained. So I have many times over the years had clients come to me and say, yeah, I went to this tax place last year, and it seems like when in years where my refund is big, they charge more, and years where my refund is less, they charge less, and I'm pretty sure they're taking a percentage of my refund, but I've never been able to you know, figure out what it is they do there. Well, if that describes your firm's policies, then your firm is actually out of compliance with the law. Your firm is not allowed to base fees on the refund or uh, an outcome on a return, and the only exception to that is uh, when a tax return is under audit, and you're basically taking on the case contingent on an outcome in that audit. A contingent fee is also, or also includes any fee arrangement in which the practitioner will reimburse the client for all or a portion of the client's fee in the event that a position taken on a tax return or other filing is challenged by the IRS or is not sustained. So you could say, well, you know what? This is a pretty iffy area. I'm not sure you're going to get away with it. But tell you what, I'll charge you $1,000 and if IRS doesn't open this up and let you keep your money, we're square. But if the IRS comes along and, and they audit you and they disallow this deduction, I'll refund the money. IRS says you can't do that either. Matters before the IRS includes tax planning and advice, preparing or filing or assisting the preparation of tax returns, preparing and filing documents, or representing a client at conferences, hearings, and meetings. Next up is return of a client's records. IRS says when a client brings you records, those records belong to the client, and when the client asks for them, you have to return them. The only exception to that rule is if you live in a state or operate in a state where the state law permits that. I don't directly know of any state that permits you to retain a client's records, but I am aware of certain states that specifically don't allow you to retain client records. Um, but you would have to be able to show that your state does permit you to retain a client's records, say the client owes you money and hasn't paid. And this is a pretty common thing. Client comes in, they sit down with you, they use up your time, you put a bunch of effort into their tax return, all of a sudden they've changed their mind, they want their documents back, they want to walk out the door and not pay you. And does that seem equitable or fair? Uh, no, it doesn't. But is it legal for the client to do that? Yes, it is. Do you have any legal recourse? through courts of law, but not through retention of client records. Conflicting interest. A practitioner shall not represent a client in his or her practice before the IRS if representation involves a conflict of interest. And it's interesting where conflict of interest can exist. 
A conflict of interest exists if representing one client would be directly adverse to serving another client, or there is a significant risk that responsibilities to one or more clients will adversely affect the practitioner's ability to service another client, or interests of the practitioner are adverse to the interests of one or more clients. So let's just suppose for several years you've been doing a partnership tax return for two partners, um, and all of a sudden there comes up to you a particular year um, where there's a lot of hissing and spitting going on, the partnership is dissolving, each partner is accusing the other partner of this is and that, so each one's wanting you to take different positions on the tax return, and you're stuck in the middle of all of that. That would be what I would say where a position affecting one client might be adverse to another client, so you have a conflict of interest. What are you going to do about that? Are you allowed to prepare the return? The IRS says, well, yes, you are allowed to do it. However, you um, have to follow some extra procedures. Firstly, the practitioner, if the tax practitioner reasonably believes that he or she is able to provide competent and diligent representation to each affected client, and the representation is not prohibited by law, and each affected client provides informed consent and signs a written waiver within 30 days, copies of written consents must be maintained for at least 36 months. So you've got this um, hissy, spitty partnership. Both partners want you. They've used you for several years. They trust you. They don't want to go anywhere else, but they're arguing over positions on the tax return. You're stuck in the middle. What can you do? Firstly, you need to decide whether you can be impartial, whether you can look at it objectively and prepare a tax return based on all the facts without an opinion and without taking sides. If you feel you can do that, then you can say so to your clients. There is a conflict of interest here under the law. I am permitted to prepare your return only if you both agree to it, and you must consent in writing. And then, of course, you're going to have to do your very best job of being impartial. And it's your call on whether you want to be in the middle of that or not. It might be just as easy to send them both hiking and stay out of it. The question is, so I tell them what I think, and then I do the return. In that situation, I would make a call about whether I'm even interested in the client. And once I've established that I am interested, I need to get signed consent from both of them, acknowledging the conflict of interest and accepting that they agree to have me prepare the return regardless of that conflict. And then I still have to act impartially. I have to show I'm objective and not taking sides, where I would give more favorable treatment to one taxpayer at the expense of the other and know that I'm doing it. OK, the next topic we're going to look at is solicitation, advertising and solicitation restrictions. A practitioner may not, without, with respect to any IRS matter, in any way use or participate in the use of any form of public communication or private solicitation that contains a false, fraudulent, or coercive statement or claim, or a misleading or deceptive statement or claim. Now, I have to say, I frequently see advertisements out there that cause me concern, such as, uh, our, our company gives bigger refunds than the next company. I would say that that's a misleading or coercive claim. Because really, we know as tax practitioners, there's only one true correct outcome on a tax return that is legally supportable and maximizes the refund. And if you know what you're doing, you will arrive at that same answer. You could line up 100 people who all know tax law, all interview in the same exact way, I'll interpret the law correctly. And when they're done, you should have one number that is the correct number. So to say that your refund is going to be bigger than the next person, you have to back that up. Our tax preparers have extensive training that far exceeds those of XYZ firm. Well, now how can you prove that? <laughs> so I think you should be very, very careful about how you hold yourself out in advertising. And essentially, maybe talk about the credentials that you have, the years of experience you have, the quality control systems you have in place. Um, be open and honest about your pricing policy. That's the very most sensible thing to do, for, at least for ethics purposes and advertising purposes. But beyond that, the IRS does get into some more specific things, such as title. Enrolled agents, enrolled retirement plan agents, and registered tax return preparers in describing their professional designation must not utilize the term certified or imply an employer-employee relationship with the IRS. Acceptable enrolled agent designations can include enrolled to represent taxpayers before the IRS, enrolled to practice before the IRS, and admitted to practice before the IRS. Acceptable enrolled retirement agent designations include similar definitions. And finally, acceptable registered tax return preparer description can include 
designated as a registered tax return preparer by the Internal Revenue Service. That actually sounds quite official to me. And you can say that, but you shouldn't say I'm certified by the IRS. That would be illegal. Now, next we have state boards of accountancies that license CPAs. Um, CPAs are governed by state boards of accountancy and must maintain licensing in accordance with individual state laws. As long as you are compliant with your state as a CPA, um, you're going to meet the requirements for IRS. But of course, you still have ethics requirements in terms of uh, how you practice as a CPA. State registration and licensing of tax preparers. The following states require tax preparer registration, and they include California, Maryland, and New York. The following state requires licensing, and that is, of course, Oregon. I have information in here about California registration requirements, Maryland registration requirements, and New York registration requirements, and then finally, Oregon licensing requirements. Just because of time, I'm not going to go through those, but if they interest you, you can read them on your own. There are a number of other titles that are not covered by state or federal regulations. There are a few for-profit and non-profit organizations that offer titles to tax preparers who either complete a specified program of education and or testing, or who become members of an association by paying a fee and adhering to ethics guidelines set forth by the organization. Well, none of those privately issued designations are recognized by the IRS or any state board. So. Uh, you, may ha you would want to be careful when you're looking at the t those titles and designations and making sure you're not attempting to use one that is a violation of, for, for example, the use of the word certified. If you're in California, you're not allowed to call yourself an accountant unless you're a CPA. So you might call yourself a bookkeeper, but you wouldn't be allowed to call yourself an accountant, for example. There's also a category, something called a certified tax preparer or a chartered tax preparer. Well, we've already shown that the IRS does not allow anyone to call themselves certified, so you should never do that. Chartered tax preparer, that simply means you graduated from one individual private school's education program and they've issued you a certificate saying you're a chartered tax preparer. But that's also not recognized at any federal or state level. Solicitation, a practitioner may not make directly or indirectly an uninvited written or oral solicitation of employment in matters related to the IRS. So you're not allowed to ask the IRS employees for work. Fee information. A practitioner may publish the availability of a written schedule of fees and disseminate the following fee information. Fixed fees for specific routine services, hourly rates, a range of fees for particular services, and the fee charged for an initial consultation. Dis disclosure of a client's responsibility for costs. Any statement of fee information concerning matters in which costs may be incurred must include a statement disclosing whether the client will be responsible for the cost. And fee changes, a practitioner may charge no more than the rates published for at least 30 calendar days after the last date on which the schedule of fees was published. So this fee information is a rather important thing. How many of us have ever been to a doctor's office to fill out all their paperwork? Probably all of us. And you may have noticed that in that paperwork, there's usually something about how you're going to pay us and that if you don't pay us, we're going to you know, come after you. And typically, in a tax preparation firm, that's not been the normal way to do things. Um, the normal way to do things in most walk-in tax offices is you come in, you sit down, you get an interview, um, you're told what your refund or your balance due is, you write a check or have the fee withheld from your refund, whatever, and you're gone. And for most of the history of the industry where I've been involved, that's pretty much what people do. Uh, CPAs have had something more formal. They've had something called an engagement letter. Attorneys do the same thing. They have an engagement letter. But really, what I'm reading into this particular piece of information here is that it's a very good idea to have something like an engagement letter. And that best practices would dictate that when a client comes in and sits down with you to get services from you, a natural progression of that interview would be, hi, welcome. Thank you for coming to see us today. Um, how can I help you? Um, why is it that you're here? What kind of services are you looking for me to perform for you? And uh, OK, now based on what you're requesting, would you like an estimate of what we're going to charge you? And the natural answer would be, yes, I would like to know what you're going to charge me. And once you've explained the fee schedule and they have retained you to provide the service to them, that would be a good point to put it all in writing and have them sign it. In other words, you should have an engagement letter of your own. That would be a very good best practices procedure because it very clearly outlines at that initial meeting 
what the client's expectations are and what your expectations are. So there shouldn't be any doubt about why the client was there. Now, is it safe for me to assume that when a client walks in the door of my tax office on April 15th with W-2s in their hand, that they probably want me to prepare their tax return? That would be a reasonable expectation, but it could be they're there for something completely different. So that interview should still take place, and uh, a wise preparer would have some policy or procedure in place to make that clear, including a disclosure of the client's responsibility to pay me. I like to get paid. Now, I did see a comment here. What about pro bono work? If you're doing a tax return pro bono, you do not need to be registered as a tax preparer. You do not need to have a PTIN, and you certainly do not sign the tax return. Um, so uh, if that answers your question, pro bono work is uh, preparing a tax return for free. And that can be done through a VITA site, some type of volunteer site, or it could be that just out of the good spirit nature of your heart, you've decided to do someone's tax return and then not charge them for it. Well, if that's the case, you shouldn't be signing it or putting your PTIN on it, nor are you required to. There's an interesting rule here that, uh, regarding fee changes. IRS says that a practitioner may charge no more than the rates published for at least 30 calendar days after the last date on which the schedule of fees was published. It's kind of a pain in the butt one, because if you're going to raise your prices, you have to take down your fee schedule, and then you can't raise prices for 30 days. That's what essentially they're saying. So if you want to have a fee increase effective January 1, technically you should publish that fee increase by December 1 of the preceding year. Communication of fee information. There's more information on how to do that. Um, negotiation of taxpayer refund checks, you are not allowed to endorse or otherwise cash a refund check that is issued to a taxpayer. Practice of law, a practitioner must not construe IRS regulations as the authority to practice law. And then we get on to best practices, and I've been talking a little bit about best practices, even using that term, but it is straight out of Circular 230. IRS includes best practices in the circular and defines what best practices is. Tax advisors should provide clients with the highest quality representation concerning federal tax issues by adhering to best practices in providing advice and in preparing or assisting in the preparation of a submission to the IRS. Tax advisors with responsibility for overseeing a firm's practice of providing tax advice or of preparing or assisting in the preparation of submissions to the IRS should take reasonable steps to ensure that the firm's procedures for all members, associates, and employees are consistent with best practices. So IRS requires the tax practitioner to exercise best practices and requires supervisors to ensure that their staff also exercise best practices. And here is what best practices include. Communicating clearly with the client regarding the terms of the engagement. Well, didn't I just talk about how it's a very sensible thing? It's also a required thing. And you may as well put it in writing, and then you know you have proof that that was discussed. Establishing the facts, which means determining which facts are relevant, evaluating the reasonableness of any assumptions or representations, and arriving at a conclusion that is supported by the law and the facts. Advising the client regarding the import of the conclusions reached, including, for example, whether a taxpayer may avoid accuracy-related penalties under the Internal Revenue Code, and acting fairly and with integrity in practice before the IRS. Procedures to ensure best practices. This paragraph is essentially saying you need to exercise best practices, and you're going to exercise best practices by having procedures in place to ensure that you are following best practices. So what does that mean? Well, I keep coming back on how long I've been doing this, 20 years. And we do it with multiple offices and a staff of people, some of whom are with us year-round, some of whom are come on only seasonally, some people we hire and they don't work out, some people we hire and they stay on for years. So how do we ensure that our staff know what our procedures are and follow them? Well, that means we have to have procedures. We have to know what they are, we have to train our staff on what they are, and then we have to follow up on them. That is how we ensure best practices in our firm. So any firm that is adhering to best practices should clearly have procedures in place. They should be in writing. And employees really should go through a training program to ensure that they're following them. Standards with respect to tax returns and documents. 
Regarding tax returns, a practitioner may not willfully, recklessly, or through gross incompetence sign a tax return or a claim for refund that the practitioner knows or reasonably should know contains a position that lacks a reasonable basis, is an unreasonable position, or is a willful attempt by the practitioner to understate the liability for tax or is a reckless or intentional disregard of rules or regulations by the practitioner. Or advise a client to take a position on a tax return or a claim for refund, or prepare a portion of a tax return or a claim for refund containing a position that lacks a reasonable basis, is an unreasonable position, or is a willful attempt by the practitioner to understate the liability. A pattern of conduct is a factor that will be taken into account in determining whether a practitioner acted willfully, recklessly, or through gross incompetence. So screech, I come to something here that was in tax notes today, October 24, 2011. In this particular article, Karen Hawkins, the director of, the, of OPR, states that it is not at all uncommon for a tax client to accuse a tax preparer of incompetence, negligence, giving tax advice, right, or outright fraud. And that the client can use that position as a defense to get out of paying penalties. And Karen Hawkins has said, OK, auditors, IRS personnel, when you come across a situation where you waive the penalty based on a claim that the preparer did it and I didn't know any better, we want you to maybe refer that preparer to us so we can take a look at them. Now, if you're a preparer who is in a habit of not exercising due diligence, not exercising best practices, and you do enough tax returns, what are the odds that a client of yours is going to get audited by IRS and accuse you of something? Pretty darn good. In fact, I've done tax returns for clients for 10, 15 years who I thought were my best buddies. The second they're audited, do you think that they're going to turn on me? I can't really recollect if that's happened, but I certainly know they pick up the phone and they call me, and they're very upset about the audit. And if I'm not there to support them through that audit, support the claim on their return, um, that they would easily turn on me. Because your best buddy, in a pinch, you find out what kind of a best buddy they are. And I don't think we have any tax clients who are our best friends. So we really need to practice ethics at all times, because if we don't, in the long run, it will come back and bite us. All right, documents, affidavits, and other papers. A practitioner may not advise a client to take a position on a document, affidavit, or other paper submitted to the IRS unless the position is not frivolous. A practitioner may not advise a client to submit a document, affidavit, or other paper to the Internal Revenue Service, the purpose of which is to delay or impede administration of federal tax laws that is frivolous or contains or omits information in a manner that demonstrates intentional disregard of a rule or regulation, unless the preparer also advises the client to submit a document that evidences a good faith challenge to the rule or regulation. That's pretty advanced stuff and not a typical thing that we'd ever really be able in a position to do. We should also advise our clients on potential penalties. If we see a position, we think it's an incorrect position, we think it's a questionable position, we have to tell our client what the potential outcome would be and any penalties associated with it. Relying on information furnished by a client. A practitioner advising a client to take a position on a return or preparing or signing a return as a preparer can generally rely in good faith without verification upon the information furnished by the client. So if our client comes in and says, hey, this is my W-2, we can pretty much assume that that's their W-2. We're not going to have to call the employer and verify it really is their W-2. We're not going to have to demand pay stubs to kind of balance it out, make sure it's correct. We're not required to do that. However, if there's something about that W-2 that tells us it might not be your legitimate W-2, then we are required to follow up on that. And I'll give you an example. Many years ago, we had a client come into our tax office, and she presented a W-2 that had, I'm trying to think, let's just say $25,000 of wage income and $8,000 of federal withholding. That was questionable to me. Not impossible, but highly unlikely. So what did I do? I called or attempted to figure out who the employer was and contact them, and essentially established that there was no such employer or that the employee did not work for that employer. It was essentially a fraudulent, fake W-2 
created for the sole purpose of ripping off our government. Uh, I identified it as such, and I reported it to the IRS. <laughs> okay, so that type of thing is what the IRS is saying. You can rely on it generally in good faith, but if it walks like a duck, talks like a duck, it probably is a duck, and you need to act accordingly. Responsibility for positions on tax returns. Uh, this is just information about when there's multiple people in a firm who is ultimately responsible. The IRS will look to everyone whose hands touch the return, but if they can't establish who touched the return beside the signing preparer, the majority of the onus will go on the signing preparer, but they can look beyond the signing preparer. There's additional regulations regarding requirements for covered opinions and procedures to ensure compliance with covered opinions. We're not going to get into that. You're on your own if you want to read about it. Uh, Section 10.38 has to do with establishment of advisory committees. To promote and maintain public confidence in the tax advisors, the IRS is authorized to establish one or more advisory committees. And frequently, emails come out from IRS uh, news releases about an advisory committee is being established for this purpose or that purpose. And if you would like to be considered, you need to apply. And so if you want to know more about that, you can read section 10.38. Subpart C, this is a section that IRS says you should know the contents of it because uh, it is included in the enrolled agent exam. It's also tested in the RTRP exam. Uh, what are the sanctions? What are the penalties? Um, what are reasons why you would be sanctioned or penalized? Given the amount of time we have left in class, I'm not going to be able to read through all of them. But let's look at the primary one, section 10.5, sanctions. Um, the IRS can censure, suspend, or disbar a practitioner if the practitioner is shown to be incompetent or disreputable within the meaning of section 10.51 fails to comply with any regulation in this part or with intent to defraud willingly and knowingly misleads or threatens a client or prospective client, censure is a public reprimand. And so IRS says they can censure you if they show that you are incompetent or disreputable. So what is incompetence or disreputable conduct? Firstly, conviction of any criminal offense under federal tax law or conviction of any criminal offense involving dishonesty or breach of trust. Conviction of any felony, uh, felony under federal or state law. Um, conviction or giving false or misleading information. Solicitation of employment as prohibited. Willfully failing to make a federal tax return, that is keeping yourself in order. Willfully assisting, counseling, encouraging a client or prospective client in violating or suggesting to a client or prospective client that they violate federal tax law. Misappropriation of or failure properly or promptly to remit funds received from a client for purposes of paying taxes. This is actually one I never step into that boat. I know there are some firms out there who will, you know, the client will come in, oh, you owe $10,000 to the IRS, write the check, and I'll get that in the mail for you. It's like, there ain't no way I'm getting between my client, their money, and the IRS. I just stick totally clear of that one. It is legal to put yourself in the middle, take that money, and remit it to the IRS, but if you fail to do so, you can be in trouble. And I absolutely do not put myself <laughs> in that situation. With the sole exception being if my client wants to have a direct debit to their bank account, where their uh, balance due will come from their bank account and go directly to the IRS, I do that, but I don't like to collect their money and mail it for them. Disbarment or suspension from practice as an attorney, CPA, public accountant, or actuary, knowing, aiding, and abetting, or knowingly aiding and abetting another person to practice before the IRS when they are under disbarment or not eligible, contemptuous conduct in connection with practice before the IRS, including the use of abusive language, making false accusations, that you know to be false or circulating or publishing malicious or libelous matter, giving a false opinion. Now the IRS has information on their website, you can go read it at any time, where they provide the very latest news on what it is they're interested in. It hasn't been updated for several months. The last time I saw anything new coming out of OPR was really in uh, May. Um, some, some of it is older than that. But uh, just this past week, there was another news release coming out with who had been disbarred and for what. So if you're interested in that type of thing, you can read up on it. Other reasons that you would be considered um, negligence or incompetent, will it, willfully failing to sign a tax return that you are required to sign, willfully disclosing or otherwise using a tax return or tax return information in a matter that is not authorized by the IRS. 
willfully failing to file on magnetic or other electronic media a tax return prepared by the practitioner when the practitioner is required to do so. So for example, we have the 10 return rule that if you are preparing 10 or more returns or your firm is preparing 10 or more returns, 10 or more returns, they all have to be e-filed. Uh, failure to do so would be a violation. Willfully preparing all or substantially all or signing a tax return or claim for refund when the practitioner does not possess a current or otherwise valid PTIN. Willfully representing a taxpayer before an officer or employee of the Internal Revenue Service unless the practitioner is authorized to do so. And then in subpart D, we get to rules applicable to disciplinary proceedings. Subpart D is what you need to know if you are in trouble. You've received a letter from the Office of Professional Responsibility and it says you're under investigation for all of these matters. And these are all of the instructions on what to do in that situation. The most key thing in here, and something I remember being included on the enrolled agent exam when I took it many years ago, is procedures for responding to a complaint. And the IRS says you cannot ignore a complaint, nor can you ignore any part of a complaint. So if a complaint letter comes to you, it might say, we're accusing you of three things. You would need to respond to each of those three things individually. And failure to respond to any one of the three things would be an admission of guilt regarding that thing. So again, if you do get a letter from the IRS or if you're going to be taking a test from the IRS on how to respond to a complaint, you definitely want to be familiar with all of the provisions of Section D. And then subpart E, general provisions. This has to do with records and a roster. The IRS is going to make available to the public a roster of all individuals who are authorized as enrolled agents, enrolled retirement plan agents, registered tax return preparers, as well as a roster of disqualified appraisers and a roster of qualified continuing education providers. The roster of registered tax return preparers and enrolled agents will also include people, a roster of who's been disbarred. Um, other records, all other records of the Director of the Office of Professional Responsibility may be disclosed upon special request in accordance with public law, including PTIN lists. So some people have been wondering how schools like us get hold of your identity and your email address and so forth. That's actually available under the Freedom of Information Act, so you do want to be careful what you put on your official records filed with the IRS um, for contact information and so forth, because that is a matter of public record and is released under the Freedom of Information Act. Next, we have how to apply for the special enrollment exam. If you're interested in that, there's information on the next couple of pages. Information on power of attorney and revoking power of attorney. There's one other item that I included in this manual that I think is important, and it has to do with Title 20, practice before the tax court. So many times over the years, and I'm on page 65 of the manual now, I have heard tax practitioners make the claim, well, the only thing I can't do that an enrolled agent can do is represent someone before the tax court. Well, actually, even an enrolled agent can't represent someone before the tax court or a CPA without a, a, obtaining the proper credential. And it's not an easy credential to get. So this is information about what you would need to do if you actually want to represent your client in tax court. And being an enrolled agent or a CPA in and of itself is not a qualification for that. You have to go through a very specific procedure. Other regulations. Now, at the start of today's class, I told you that there were all kinds of other additional regulations governing tax preparers. And those are listed on the following pages. Section 6107 states that you must give your client a copy of the tax return that you've prepared for them, but you only have to do so once except in the case of married taxpayers where you would be required to give each partner in the marriage a copy of the return. Identifying numbers under Section 6109, identifying numbers must be provided to the IRS on all tax returns. And individuals who are required to provide numbers must do so. There is a fine if you are required to provide a number and fail to do so. For example, I am a child care provider and I am providing child care services, my customer comes to me and asks for my identification number so that they can claim the child independent care credit. I am required under the law to give them my number. And if I fail to do so, I can be fined. Similarly, um, I am filing married filing separate. I need to put my spouse's social security number on my married filing separate return. If my spouse refuses to provide me with that number, 
my spouse can be fined. Vice versa, the IRS would impose the fine. Password number three is subspace, S-U-B-S-P-A-C-E. Civil penalties, I'm not going to read these penalties to you, but these are all of the reasons the IRS can penalize you. The fine per violation and the maximum fine in any one year for a series of violations. They range anywhere from a low of $50 to a high of $500, usually per violation, um, except in this area here, aiding and abetting an understatement of tax liability, the fine could be uh, $1,000 per return. And then we go on to the e-file mandate, which I promised I wouldn't have time for. And the other thing I knew I would never get to is the group discussion. But let's just finish up with this first one right here, because this one is my favorite. Here are the questions I would ask. Consulting. Who did you pay to consult? If that person were an individual or, a pers or an entity that is not a corporation, have you issued them a 1099? Miscellaneous says you are required to do so under the law. That would be the first question I would come to. Education. What kind of education was this? Was this continuing education in your current occupation? Or did you pay for your kid to go to college? Or did you uh, attend some college courses that really have nothing to do with your current line of work? Because if that education is not CPE for your current line of work, it is not a business expense. And I'm going to need to yank that one right out and your profit just bounced up by $4,000. Uh, next, internet. OK, are you working from a home office? What specifically is that internet charge for? Let's establish that it is a legitimate business expense and what percentage of it is business related. Miscellaneous. There is no line anywhere on any IRS form that says miscellaneous expenses that I can remember seeing. Uh, miscellaneous is exactly the category that any IRS auditor is going to burrow into, and it's the first category I burrow into. What made up $10,000 of miscellaneous expense? I'm going to burrow into that, establish what's deductible, what's not deductible, and throw it into correct categories. Rent. Rent for what? Do you rent an office space, or are you working from home? Who did you pay the rent to? And by the way, if you actually have a landlord that you're paying in the course of your business and that landlord is not incorporated, you need to enter the, uh, issue them a 1099 miscellaneous too. Next, payroll. You're a consultant. Who's on payroll? Have you filed 941s? Are you up to date on your payroll taxes? Have you issued W-2s? So payroll. If you have employees, did you issue the correct W-2s? And if you don't have employees, then that payroll is just what you paid yourself, and it's not an expense at all. Supplies. $10,000 for supplies for a consultant. Doesn't that seem kind of high? What were those supplies? And by the way, if any of those supplies are actual um, assets, they belong on a depreciation schedule anyway. Taxes. What kind of taxes? Were these estimated taxes, or were they payroll taxes? Because if they're estimated taxes, they're not an expense on the tax return. Travel and meals. $15,000 seems like an awful high number. And even if it's totally legit, I still need to break out meals, because you're only allowed 50% of that cost. And then finally, utilities. Again, do you have uh, an office, or is this part of a home office? So that would be the kind of questions Jack should ask about this tax return. So that concludes our course on IRS uh, ethics rules uh, governing CPAs, EAs, and uh, registered tax return preparers. You have just finished watching a lecture that I gave to a live audience of roughly 70 tax professionals. And in that live lecture, you do see that I did run out of time, and I was not able to cover the manual in its entirety. But if you are studying for the registered tax return preparer exam, you really should slow down and read any portions of the manual that I, that I did not cover in that lecture. Quite frankly, you should read all of the ethics questions. Uh, you saw, as I was pointing out in the lecture, that the IRS RTRP exam is going to be focusing very much on practices and procedures and on ethics rules from Circular 230. There's really two 
full sections of the test devoted to those topics, so you can't underestimate the importance of the topic covered in uh, Session 23 of our course. Also, I did want to draw your attention to two other publications that IRS has specifically said it will include test questions on in the Registered Tax Return Prepare exam. The first of these publications you can now see on the screen in front of you. It is the Handbook for Authorized E-File Providers of Individual Income Tax Returns. I wanted to point this publication out to you. I am not going to read it to you. You're basically on your own. You need to open this publication up. It is 63 pages long, and you should take, you really should read the entire thing. IRS does consider it to be an ethics issue that you understand the policies that the government has with regards to electronic filing, that you know what the rules are for electronic filing return originators. Now, for all of the years I've been doing tax returns, I've always considered electronic filing procedures to be a matter of policy and procedure training for my employees. I've never included the topic in my basic tax course because I've really felt that a basic tax course is all about preparing a tax return. But the IRS says part of preparing a tax return is that you follow e-file mandate rules. And it is mandatory that you e-file a tax return unless you have qualified for and filed for an exemption from the requirement to e-file. And if you have not received an exemption from e-filing, then you are required to know how to e-file and you are required to e-file all of the returns that you prepare. So this particular publication covers all of the procedures involved in electronic filing and you should read it. It's going to be easy to understand the topics covered in here. There really isn't anything that, that is that complicated, but you still need to have read the publication. In Chapter 2 of the publication, the IRS has listed the must-read stuff, and that probably means you must read it. <laughs> and that's probably where gonna, they're going to be getting test questions from is the must-read section. So I just wanted to point that out to you. It is Chapter 2, but all in all, you need to read the entire publication. And we will probably throw a few test questions into our exam on uh, the contents of the IRS e-file publication. The next publication IRS says you need to read is this publication, which is Publication 4600, Safeguarding Your Taxpayer Information. This is essentially about the graham leach billy Act, or the graham leach Biley Act, and uh, that act set procedures for safeguarding ta your tax clients' records and protecting their privacy, and the IRS has said that they will include questions from this particular publication as well. It barely qualifies as a publication. It's really a tri-fold 8.5 by 11 brochure. And I've just got side one here and then on side two, information safeguards shortlist. But I will take a look at a little bit more detail with this with you since it's so short and since they are going to test on it. And IRS introduces this particular publication by saying that safeguarding taxpayer information is a top priority for the IRS and it is the responsibility of governments, businesses, organizations, and individuals that receive, maintain, share, transmit, or store taxpayers' personal information to safeguard it. Taxpayer information is any information furnished in any form or manner uh, by or on behalf of a taxpayer for the preparation of their tax returns. It includes, but it is not limited to, a taxpayer's name, address, identification number, income, receipts, deductions, exemptions, tax liability, etc. So your job is, of course, to read through this and be familiar with the t contents of the publication. The safeguards shortlist that the IRS says should be adhered to by any tax business employee or owner is maintaining a list of all of the locations that you handle taxpayer information, assessing the risk of unauthorized access, disclosure, modification, or destructure of the taxpayer information that you handle. For example, can visitors taxpayer tax information that you keep? They shouldn't be able to. Can an employee with a malicious intent modify your taxpayer information on a tax return? If so, what safeguards do you put in place to prevent that? You should make it so that they can't. Can return preparation software you provide for customers cause an inadvertent disclosure of one taxpayer's information to another? You should be able to prevent that from happening. Can a computer virus corrupt taxpayer returns that you transmit? Can a flood destroy your paper and electronic records that you maintain? 
Item three, assess the impact of unauthorized access, use, disclosure, modification, or destruction of taxpayer information that you handle. Can your client become the victim of identity theft because you're not maintaining these records or handling the records in a safe way? Can a denial of service attack cause you to lose customers? Can your business incur criminal or civil penalties as a result of mishandling of taxpayer information? Number four, write and follow an information security plan that shows how you are addressing risks. That means that you should have a written policy in your organization that shows how you are going to safeguard your tax client's information. You should specify in contracts with service providers the safeguards they must follow. You should monitor how contractors handle taxpayer information. You should test, monitor, and revise your information security plan on a periodic basis. So over time, the type of plan you have might need to be changed. Put in place additional safeguards as needed. Provide privacy notices and practices to your customers if required by the Federal Trade Commission policy rule. I know that the Drake software that we currently use has a privacy notice right built in, but if it doesn't come with your software, you should have a separate one that you have your clients sign. And then, of course, follow federal, state, and local laws and regulations at all times. So that's just an overview of Publication 4600. Again, I'm going to leave it for you to read on your own. So that concludes the lecture portion of Session 23 of the Basic Tax Course. The only topic really left is a group discussion, and you can see that in the lecture I did cover Jessica and how types of questions I would ask if I were Jessica. But let's move on to item number two. Jack is an enrolled agent. He is preparing a tax return for John, who filed bankruptcy during the year. John wants to claim a deduction for attorney fees he paid. What kinds of questions should John ask? Well, for the remaining questions in this group discussion, I would like you to treat this as your classwork assignment. So at this point, please push pause on video playback and complete the group discussion exercises beginning on page 70 of your student manual. When you have finished completing the group discussion exercises beginning on page 70 of your student manual, please, please resume video playback and I will give you my thoughts on this group discussion topic. So now that you've had a chance to look at the group discussion topics, beginning on page 70 of your manual, let's take a look at what my thoughts are. Beginning with number two, Jack is an enrolled agent. He is preparing a tax return for John, who filed bankruptcy during the year. John wants to claim a deduction for attorney fees he paid. What kinds of questions should Jack ask? Let me see. John wants to claim a deduction for attorney fees he paid because he's filing bankruptcy. Well, the first question I would ask is, have you paid attorney fees that have anything to do with the production of income? If you pay attorney fees for collection of alimony or collection of rents or collection of business income, then that kind of attorney fee is deductible. But if you pay attorney fees because you're filing bankruptcy, those are not deductible. So the types of questions Jack should ask are re really revol revolving around whether or not the attorney fees paid are deductible at all. Number three, considering IRS ethics rules surrounding best practices with respect to giving tax advice, how would you respond to a client who makes the following statement? I just received some unemployment during the year, but I don't know how much. I just wanted to leave that off my return and deal with it next year. Well, best practices basically says that once your client refuses to include income on their tax return, you cannot prepare the return and you cannot sign the return. So ethically, what should you do? You should encourage your client to report the income legally. You could also tell them things like, well, if you don't report the income, it's not like the IRS isn't going to find out, because they will. And if they also find out that you deliberately left it off and filed a return without including it on there, well, that's fraud. You can get in trouble for that. You can get penalties. You can even be presented to jail time for fraud. So knowingly leaving it off, not only is it illegal for you to do so, it's illegal for me to help you with it. So basically, I need to do it correctly or I can't do your return at all. Number four, 
What thoughts does this cartoon bring to your mind with regard to tax preparer competency and ethics requirements? And as I recall, we did cover this problem or this cartoon in the video. It is a creation of my imagination, but it is also based on so many years of life experience in working with tax professionals. Please do not be that computer cripple who does not understand why your computer has produced a number or a result on a tax return. If your client wants to know why their refund is what it is or why it is not higher or why it is lower than they thought it should be, you should be able to explain that to them. And one of the things that I do when I get this kind of question is, well, my refund was larger last year. Why is it so small this year? Well, to answer that question, you really need to look at last year's tax return. Line up last year's return with this year's tax return and describe the differences to your client. One of the policies I have when I prepare a tax return is I look at last year's return and compare it to this year's return. Before I ever tell my client what their refund or balance due is for the current year, I've looked at last year's return for differences. And if there's a difference, I explain it to myself so that I am ready to explain it to my client. Because it is, of course, the case that when a refund does change dramatically from year to year, that's going to get your client's attention. After all, it's their money. They want to know why things are different. And it's your job as the tax preparer to explain it. So be prepared for that question before you ever tell them what it is they owe or have a refund on. And if there is a big difference, explain it to yourself. Because if you can't explain it to yourself, then maybe there's an error on this return or last year's return, and you're going to catch it by figuring it out. Number five, Selena, a CPA, has prepared a tax return for her client that includes a loss from a publicly traded partnership on a Schedule K-1. Selena observes that her software has allowed a loss to be claimed and is unsure if it should be allowed. What should she do? Well, this is actually a life experience for me. I frequently review tax returns that have been prepared by preparers, and essentially a loss has been allowed on the tax return where I don't think one should have been allowed. As we've learned in our class on rental expenses and passive activity loss limits, you are only allowed to claim passive activity losses if you have passive activity income to offset them or if you are in a year where you have fully disposed of your interest in a passive activity and of course, if you have sold an interest in a publicly traded partnership, you are allowed to claim in the year you dispose of your interest in that publicly traded partnership your losses from that publicly traded partnership. But unless you've sold your interest in a publicly traded partnership, the losses on that publicly traded partnership can never be used to offset other income from any other passive activity uh, at all. So publicly traded partnership Losses are passive losses. They are only allowed in a year where you have income from that same passive partnership or you have disposed of an interest in that partnership. So definitely, if your software is allowing losses on passive activities, take a look at it and make sure that the loss is allowable. Number six, Fred, a registered tax return preparer, works in a franchised tax office. He also runs his own Amway business, and Fred routinely invites tax clients to come to his Amway meetings. Is there anything in Circular 230 or other regulations that addresses this practice? And the answer is there most certainly is. Let's take a look at it. And here we have it right in the student manual on page 57 for ethics. Iris says that you may not willfully disclose or otherwise use a tax return or tax return information in a manner not authorized by the IRS. The IRS does not authorize you to use information that you've gathered from your client to market other products or services to your client. Simply not allowed. And the final item I am going to review with you in Session 23 of the Basic Tax Course is a review of the Session 22 Quiz Answer Key. I will not be providing a video review of the Ethics Quiz Answer Key. We're just going to leave you to take that quiz on your own and uh, review the answer key on your own. But for the Session 22 Quiz, I will pull up the most frequently missed questions. And the first question from the Session 22 Quiz that I'm going to review is, is question number three. In October 2011, you sold property at a net gain of $80,000. This was your only income for the year. If you make no estimated tax payments and use the annualized income exception to the underpayment penalty, you will only be required to pay a penalty for the final quarter of the year. 
That is actually a true statement. And really, it boils down to your comprehension of the purpose for the use of Form 2210. 2210 allows you to annualize your income for figuring your underpayment of estimated tax penalty or to really get yourself out of one. And clearly, if the only income you have for the year is a sale of property in October, there would be no reason for the IRS to expect you to be making estimated tax payments in earlier quarters where you had no income and possibly even no expectation of income. So the annualized method that uses Form 2210 would allow you to figure the amount of estimated tax that you owe for the year based on no income in the first two quarters or even the first three quarters. In the case of this problem, there is no income for three quarters, and in the final quarter, there is income. And that means one estimated tax payment could be made in January, and if that payment is timely made, there would be no penalty. Question number six. Quarterly estimated tax payments are generally due on April, July, September, and January 15. That is a false statement. The second payment of the year is actually due June 15, so B is the correct answer. That is a false statement. Number seven, a timely filed 2011 married filing separate return can be amended to married filing joint by what date? And the answer that is correct is at any time within the next three years from the due date of the return, not including extensions. Now, I know from many years of having taught this course that many students get hung up on this concept, can I change my filing status from married filing separate to married filing joint after the due date of the return? And the answer is yes, you can. You can do it any time within three years from the due date of the return, not including extensions, if you are going married filing separate to married filing joint. But if, by contrast, you were going married filing joint to married filing separate, can you do that after the due date of the return? And the answer is no, you cannot. But for question number seven, C is the correct answer. The next question we're looking at is number 14. When assembling a paper federal return for mailing to the IRS, you should do which of the following? Attach your Form W-2 to the front page of the return? Yes. Assemble the forms and schedules in any order that is convenient to you? No, <laughs> there is actually an order, and that's why C is also part of the correct answer. Attach the forms and schedules behind Form 1040 in the order of their attachment sequence number. That makes D the correct answer. Let me open up a folder here and show you what I mean. I have a folder here with a bunch of IRS forms in it. And the first form I'm going to show you is Form 1040. And you will see that on the Form 1040, up in the upper right-hand corner here, there is no number. 1040 is the first form, and you have other forms that attach under it. So let's look at some of those other forms. And I'm going to pull up Form 1116, which is the foreign tax credit form. And if you look in the upper right-hand corner of this form, it says attachment sequence number 19. That tells you that in the form order, 1116 should be attached behind 1040 and behind any other form that has a sequence number that is lower. And here is Form 2210. You can see it goes in sequence number 6. So it would go on top of Form 1116. And here is Form 4972, attachment sequence number 28. This means it falls behind both 1116 and 2210. So all IRS forms have sequence numbers on them, of course, except the very top form, say 1040. All of the other forms that are attached behind 1040 always have a sequence number, and you need to attach forms that are mailed to IRS and by sequence number. And that is why D is the correct answer. And the final question we're going to review in the Session 22 quiz is question number 15. If you fail to pay your federal income tax due by the due date, the penalty is which of the following? And it offers A, one half of 1% of the unpaid taxes for each month or a part of a month, B, 1% of the unpaid taxes for each month or part of a month, or C, not more than 25% of the unpaid tax. Well, the correct answer is D, both A and C. The true penalty is calculated at a rate of one-half of 1% 1 of unpaid tax for each month or a part of a month. Uh, and on top of that, you can have late filing penalties. So IRS assesses underpayment penalties, late payment penalties, and late filing penalties. But typically, the penalties will not be more than 25% of the unpaid tax, which makes D the correct answer. So that concludes session 23 of the basic tax course. At this point, what have you got left to do? You need to go take 
the open book final exam, which involves preparation of a complex tax return for Mr. Chris Kringle and his family. You also need to take the closed book final exam, which is a multiple choice true and false exam. Prior to taking the closed book exam, you should take or will need to take our practice final exam. We do not provide you with a copy of the closed book final exam to keep or even to review. You will take that test, be graded on that test, you will be given a passing score or a fail score on that test, and uh, essentially you will not be allowed to have a copy of the test questions or the answers for our closed book final exam. But we did want to set you up so that you do have an opportunity to see what you're good at and what you're not so good at, and therefore we have a practice final exam. So the final session of this course, session 24, is going to involve or allow you to take a practice final exam. It's not the real thing, it's just setting you up for the closed book final exam. So this concludes session 23 of the basic tax course. Thank you for your participation. I hope you enjoy the learning opportunity that the practice final exam provides you. And uh, thank you for taking the basic tax course. And best of luck to you on the registered tax return preparer exam. If you are a California student or an Oregon student, you still need to st study state law. But students from any state other than Oregon or California, you are just about done with the basic tax course. All you need to do is take your practice final exam, your open book fi final, and your closed book final. Thank you, and bye-bye.